thanks for you, those of you who were here this morning and you're sticking out the whole day. I think you'll find the rest of the board meeting interesting also and looking forward to not only our formal parts, but especially the one we're going to move right up now. Um, but I guess I need to call the meeting to order first. Good afternoon. The time is now 1.20 p.m. and a quorum of the board is present. The State Board of Ed meeting of August 12, 2014 is hereby called to order. And we're going to move right up to public participation. And uh, this is kind of managed by the great Mertz. Um, and I think anyone who doesn't have a green sheet in yet, not too late. You're welcome to get that up if you don't mind getting it up now so we can manage the time. Um, I, I would say this, just a few opening comments. Uh, at the June meeting and again today, uh, the board set aside time for pub public comment regarding the state superintendent search. I'm not sure what that's about. Um, <laughs> so we, we plan to do the superintendent search comments after the general public comment. And we'll be accepting public comment on state soup search, the board will, through August 31st. Uh, I'm sure they would be personally after that time also. This is the more formal way. And please be aware that you may also provide input in the following ways on the State Board website, michigan.gov slash SBE, under the tab Superintendent Search. Um, the Board has a Facebook page, Michigan State Superintendent Search, and they have email, state soup, S-U-P-T, state souped search at michigan.gov. Um, so, Mertz, I'll turn that over to you. Okay, we've got quite a few forms today, so we are going to be giving three minutes um, per person to um, come to the foot of the table here. If you've got handouts, if you pass them to the people closest to you, they'll be happy to share them with the rest of the people around the table. Um, the, just to remind you, the board does not um, engage in a discussion here at the board table. They may contact you at a later date, but um, it's their matter of policy here that they do not engage in a back and forth conversation. So I'll let you know who's coming to the table and I'll let you know who's on deck since this is baseball season and you'll have three minutes and you'll be able to watch this timer. Okay, so the first person is Ann Forgrave and she will be followed by John Love. Ms. Forgrave, if you'd please come to the end of the table here. <laughs> Except we're going to win. Well, we're in it. We're going to win. <laughs> oh, good afternoon. Hi. I'm Ann Forgrave. I'm here representing Michigan Protection and Advocacy Service, where I am an education advocate. If I'll pass those around. Um, in particular, we just wanted a brief moment to give the agency perspective on the uh, proposed model code of student conduct which I know you addressed in June and, and um, is on the consent agenda for this afternoon, correct? Um, we did post the comments on the survey site, so I don't know how many of you may have had a chance to already look at them. I'm not going to go over it item by item. I would definitely exceed my three minutes if I did that, <laughs> but I hope you have a moment to finish looking it over before um, this afternoon. Michigan Protection and Advocacy Service, for those of you who aren't familiar, um, is the agency, the State Protection and Advocacy Agency. Um, every state does have one by federal mandate. And we advocate for the legal rights of people with disabilities. According to Michigan Department of Ed data, um, and as we also know, uh, just from the work we do, there is a definite disproportion of kids who are suspended and expelled from school who do have disabilities. Um, particularly from 2012-13 data, they lost over 190,000 hours of instruction due to suspension and expulsion. And that's probably underreported because it does not take into account the large number of kids who are invited to stay home without the process of suspension or expulsion. So absences, excused absences, especially in the elementary schools. Um, sorry, maybe this, you know, this is time where some time at home would be beneficial for all concerned, which, you know, unfortunately still leads to the kids not having access to instruction, nor the protections that might be there um, through the due process protections for people, for students with disabilities or without disabilities. So with that in mind, our agency strongly supports 
the emphasis in the proposed model code, which is let's keep kids in school learning. Let's use um, offenses as learning opportunities rather than strictly um, occasion for punishment. And using evidence-based practices, having the toolkit on there for protective, or I'm sorry, um, positive behavior interventions, for restorative justice, um, and anything that is a resource for the school, we strongly support. We did see, and I can't remember exactly where in the document, um, there was a link to special education rights. Oh, am I up already? Oh, gosh, okay, so again, please, <laughs> please <laughs> take the opportunity to read this. There is a, a case example at the end, which just sort of shows the downward spiral of what can happen when um, the more proactive, positive supports are not in place, including for kids with disabilities. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is John Love, followed by Kyle Smitley. Uh, as a copy of uh, yeah. this story about Illich's ice rink, and here's my comments. So okay. I'll take one each. And there's some extras for uh, anybody who would like to see what happens here. We, we have to keep that behind the desk now, I believe, that <laughs> for time. Yeah. <laughs> there's some That's really just a gross bad point. stuff in the back. Oh, <laughs> right. Right. Well, that's too bad to <laughs> it's, an, it's a, a meritorious yeah, article. <laughs> as opposed to what you see in the Detroit News and Free Press. So whenever you're ready, we're ready. All right, let's do it. And the, I read this Free Press article and wanted to talk to you and share about the uh, charter schools and the uh, fact that they're paid too much for what they do. And this Illich uh, article about how they've raided the school aid fund for a half billion dollars. And the last one is this Detroit emergency manager situation where they have three emergency managers. When do you figure out you have an emergency? Three? They can't figure out how to do anything. You don't send a general down there to take care of the problem. You send an army down there. And that's the responsibility under, under the Constitution, Article 8, Section 3, the duties of this body right here. General supervision of all public education. That isn't just some of it. That isn't somewhere around here. It's all of it. That's the exact same power that the regents have at the University of Michigan. So you can pick up the phone, and they made, in the Constitution, they made the superintendent the go-to man to fix it. And you as a body of directors are the people that take care of it. And it's uh, going back to school. It's coming up. we got to fix these things, and it's your responsibility to manage this. You should be having a meeting here of what's the money, how many students, who's on the blacklist, what the situation is. This charter deal, K through 8, does nothing. They don't have a football team. They don't run buses. They don't have handicapped operations. They don't have pensions. They don't have to deal with dropouts. That's why, and it's K through 8. Their costs are about 3000 a kid, and you give them 7000 a child. You give them the same amount that you give to a school system, that has a high school operation, that has all of these transportation obligations and everything else. They should be doing this at half rate instead of pocketing the money. And you're permitting it. You have the power, and the Democrats are supposed to be against this stuff. You have the power to vote today to say that's the end of the ballgame. That's the Constitution. That's not the legislature. And it's very specific. And I read Strauss's uh, Supreme Court case. And that's what the judges said. So it's, that's it. This Illich deal is just unconscionable, raiding the school aid fund to fund the ice skating rink. That's a violation of the Constitution, too, because school aid money is exclusively for school districts, not for hockey rinks. And, and we got to send the troops into Detroit. Highland Park, half of them are already in Detroit's system. They should consolidate them. Uh, they should join up with Wayne State University that was part of the school system originally and put the whole ball game on the field to fix that place, not get another emergency manager. They're running out of steam, and the newspapers really don't cover this in any depth. That's unfortunate. <laughs> so I'm giving you a little insight of what needs to happen. Good luck. We're all on the soup. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Thank you. Good to see you again. The, the next speaker is Kyle Smithley. She will be followed by Chuck Fellows. All set? We're set when you're set. Great. Uh, I'm Kyle Smitley. I just wanted to provide a face for a management company. Uh, I run a charter school. I'm the founder and director of Detroit Achievement Academy. Detroit Achievement Academy is a small elementary charter school in Northwest Detroit. 100% of our students qualify for free lunch. We're a single site school, so we're not a part of any networks. <laughs> Last year, this past school year, we had the highest percentage of students hitting nationally normed NWEA MAP, MAP growth targets in the city of Detroit. Our first grade math growth scores were in the 95th percentile nationally. Uh, it's pretty amazing to see sorts of numbers like that after our very first year, considering it was also my very first year in the world of education at all. I took a roundabout way to the world of education. I started my company right before I started law school. By the time I graduated from law school, I'd been featured in press ranging from Forbes magazine to the Today Show, and I was fortunate enough to be the frequent guest at the White House and most well-known Silicon Valley companies. I mention this just to set the context for how we look at running a school. I started a school with the same priorities held by the world's most successful companies. Number one, turn out the best product from the very start. Number two, hire the best people. Number three, use best practices to guide every single decision. While working on our application for our charter, we meticulously studied successful schools and failing schools for about two years. We did this because the market trained me that my product was paramount. While working on our application, we did that. In our studies and planning, we drastically underestimated how complicated the ed landscape in Michigan was. This really complicated how I executed my three priorities. Uh, our first application was rejected by all eight authorizers to which we applied, assumedly due to my lack of, lack of experience in the education world. After our initial rejection, we retooled our application, hired the greatest principal ever, and uh, we received our charter from Grand Valley in 2013. That comes with a lot of accountability. Grand Valley is present at every single board meeting. They have held our board to best practices since their very first board meeting. They trained me on the a lot, massive amounts of compliance, uh, and they hold me accountable to meeting several state mandated reports and deadlines every single month. I prepare many financial reports every single month and every single quarter and every single year. Uh, Michigan is in an education crisis, but the free press missed the most important part. It's our lack of focus on outcomes and our floundering ability to open schools who can offer kids a fair shot that matters, rather than our inputs, how we report them, or whether there should be charter schools at all. Charters have led ed reform across the country. Why are we trying to restrict them unilaterally in Michigan now? Outputs are king in every other industry. Why aren't we up in arms about outcomes here in Michigan? Why, are we, why do we think that focusing on the inputs of charter schools alone will raise outcomes for kids? Uh, the climate in Michigan is not friendly to innovators like myself. The idea that anyone can just open a charter school couldn't be further from the truth. People like me are standing on the sidelines right now listening to the conversations, but I think we need to change the conversation. Let's focus on the outcomes and how we hold all schools accountable to their outcomes as much as we're focusing on holding charter schools accountable to their inputs. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. The next speaker is Chuck Fellows, followed by... Carlos Johnson. Good afternoon and thank you. I'm Chuck Fellows. I'm president of the FlexTech High School Board of Directors, a charter school in Brighton, Michigan. I found the recent series in the Detroit Free Press and the conclusions being drawn in the public forum about charter schools especially upsetting. Given the tone and lack of context in the series, I was appalled at first. Getting past my initial angst, I realized that an opportunity for a candid dialogue may have been created to eliminate the persistent for and against discussion which is diverting attention from our shared goal of children learning. Unfortunately, inertia in a large institutional system is an effective roadblock to real change. As in the case in medicine, we treat the symptoms instead of finding the cure. The State Board of Education, as Michigan's education leader, can address this paralysis of reform by creating policy that will release the logjam, permitting a focus on learning and continually improving our system of education. By establishing clear policy expectations for teacher-to-teacher -teacher collaboration, broad-based assessments, and funding based on need, the State Board can improve learning opportunities for all. Outside of the pro forma consultant-driven forums and seminars, 
or within the stilted confines of hierarchical department structures of today's educational regime, it is difficult for teachers to collaborate with one another. I know, I've been there. Contrast this environment with the collaborative culture and flat organizational structures present in effective charter schools, a characteristic that is essential to successful student and teacher learning. A policy encouraging teacher to teacher collaboration within traditional systems must go hand in hand with a policy demanding listening to the people that actually do the work of learning, the teachers and the students. The tyranny of the standardized test must end. Testing is essential, but the emphasis should be on teacher-led, formative, high-frequency testing that allows children to demonstrate an understanding of knowledge gained. Omnibus calendar-driven testing must end and be replaced with sampling protocols and the use of appropriate statistical tools in order to inform change efforts that lead to improvement. Labeling children as failures doesn't work. Funding should be based on early identification of a child's learning profile as defined by qualified teachers and assessments that provide insight into a child's strength. Recent studies suggest that the dollar invested early, in early returns many times that investment to society. Your conundrum is how to infuse policy with a focus on long-term incremental continual improvement that offsets the inertia of the status quo. Along the way, you must avoid the mind's worst disease, that of being for or against something instead of focusing on children learning. And if you want to know if a child is learning, ask a teacher. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Carlos Johnson, followed by Dan Quisenberry. Good afternoon, board. Thank you for allowing me to uh, come before you today. I'll be brief. Uh, my name is Carlos Johnson. I am a, uh, a student from Detroit Public Schools. I am a proud parent of a son who's gone to Detroit Public Schools. I am a uh, proud past board president and uh, currently my profession as a behavioral therapist is an educational consultant. Uh, not only do I work with charter schools here in Michigan, but I work, I've had the opportunity to work with charter schools around this country. So I can kind of bring a, uh, a more global perspective if you don't mind. Um, I've, uh, I thank you for your accountability measures, I really do. Uh, Stephen Covey tells us that uh, without accountability, there will be no responsibility. Uh, Frederick Douglass tells us that uh, power with uh, uh, power uh, 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 needs to con power uh, that does not uh, have a demand on it uh, uh, runs them up. Uh, what I do want to say today is uh, that there are many great examples of charter schools. When I look at uh, boys who are struggling in our traditional schools, uh, I don't have to tell you guys about the research. African American males are struggling across this country. I, I look and I turn to Urban Prep in Chicago that's doing phenomenal things with boys who are being uh, overdiagnosed with ADD, who are being over-resourced uh, 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 for behavioral issues. When I look at uh, the economy today, I look at ACE in Charlotte, North Carolina, who is turning out young people who are focused in on entrepreneurship. Um, when I look at um, uh, students who are coming into this country from uh, different uh, countries, from different places, I, I turn my eyes to Global Preparatory Academy, who is uh, teaching uh, 15 different nationalities on how to uh, be great citizens in this country. So when I think about charter schools, I think uh, of not just choice, uh, but a, a diversity of options, if you will. It gives us an opportunity to uh, meet a child where their need is. Uh, it gives us the opportunity to come out of the box. It gives us the opportunity to take a child who would fail in another environment uh, to give them the option to exceed uh, in an environment that's more conducive to their individual learning style, um, which is extremely important if you look at the research on learning styles. Uh, for us to uh, avoid or to turn away from children don't learn the same way, uh, from science, pure science, now that we understand um, what the brain does and how it works with the ability to look through uh, uh, PET scans, and, and we now no longer can think that there's one size that fits all. Um, so I, I, I'm a champion for charter schools, not that it all schools should become charter, but I'm a champion for a diversity of choice. And I thank you all for your accountability measures, and I thank you all for continuing to support the charter school movement. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. 
Our next speaker is Dan Quisenberry, followed by John Stewart. Welcome. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, uh, there's been lots of discussion uh, these days about accountability. So we wanted to come and offer a suggestion and a pledge, and a, a commitment to genuine accountability. Uh, accountability for not only charter schools, but all public schools. Accountability for organizations that hold schools accountable, like authorizers, even like your role as state board members. We think it's really important. It's also very difficult when you're throwing these words around. What do we mean by accountability? So part of my job today was to talk about the things that are unique to charters that actually go beyond <laughs> the accountability structures that are in place for all public schools in Michigan. And our pledge or at, our request for you today would be to consider them. Let's have the same standards for everyone. There may be things here that you want to hold all public schools accountable for in this manner. Um, Certainly, uh, oversight uh, is one of those. Uh, charter schools have a unique role in having them, their own authorizer. Uh, we believe in uh, we should be adopting a very easy to understand way uh, of looking at academic performance. An A through F letter grading system would make it easier for not only you to do your job about looking at how schools, uh, authorizers, et cetera, are doing their jobs but would be making it a very easy or a lot easier for the public to understand how our schools are performing compared to, the, to, to each other. Uh, we think it's important to have open en enrollment systems that not just where you reside, but uh, a school, any, any school should be open to whatever students would apply uh, up to a limited capacity that they may have. Uh, we think uh, avoiding conflicts of interest are important. No school should hire someone that's been identified that has a family relationship with anyone on the board of directors uh, of their school. That's certainly true for charter schools, not necessarily true for traditional schools. Our standards uh, are required by law to be higher there. Um, we should uh, have uh, an opportunity for contracts between the board and any kind of service provider to be reviewed and maybe disapproved. Again, that's true for uh, authorizers in a charter school. Uh, we need to find uh, something comparable for the traditional system so contracts relationships can be reviewed. And then there needs to be consequences for adults. Too many times students suffer from uh, the failures of our schools when they occur. Uh, we think we should be having uh, consequences for the adults that don't meet uh, our academic outcome expectations. So uh, things including automatic closures ought, ought to be something that's considered for everyone. A charter basically is a performance contract and we support automatic closure. Um, we also agree with holding authorizers accountable. Our recent comments and uh, the discussion yesterday is more about the criteria for getting there. Uh, we're committed to continuing to work with the superintendent and the uh, Department of Education on making sure there's criteria available, knowing how to best exercise your uh, role, Mr. Superintendent, over authorizers, and we're going to continue to do that. One of those will be a key thing of looking at academic outcomes that really make sense. Um, that uh, really reflect the uh, growth that a school is having and, and keeping our focus, as you've heard from others already, on student outcomes where they should be. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Dan. I have a copy of the pledge if you'd like to take it. <laughs> we would welcome you to sign on. Thanks. Our next speaker is John Stewart, followed by Tedra Jackson. Okay. My name is John Stewart. I am an attorney of 36 years, former state rep 2000 to 2006. And yes, this says Milliken on this pin that is 47 years old. <laughs> enough is enough. I don't have time for anything that isn't based on the truth. I represented the excellence in public education, Plymouth Canton, Northville, Livonia, and Wayne Westland from 2000 to 2006. Stable, adequate funding, profiteering, privatization. When you hold $14 billion out there in a school aid fund, that is a human nature irresistible target for people to make money off of children's education, for people to get rich. 78% of all of charter schools in Michigan are for profit. Public education is not a free market business, nor is it an industry. 
Public education is the cornerstone of our democracy and the foundation of our society. Exorbitant leases and corrupt financing requires two things. Full disclosure, because the attorney generals in Ohio, Pennsylvania, and Colorado have initiated lawsuits <clears throat> against private management companies. Secondly, we need a moratorium. Free Press Series has stood the test of time. Full disclosure, I spoke to Jennifer Dixon once a month for the past two years. You want to call me deep throat, go right ahead. In-depth research, intellectual honesty, and credibility. I have had a 12-year working relationship with Dr. Gary Miron and Dr. David Arson and called both to testify. My Republican colleagues 12 years ago broke out in hives. The real experts are the professors of education from our excellent public universities. Michigan State and Western Michigan are always ranked. Michigan State, 19th consecutive year, number one college of education in the United States. The real experts are our professionally trained public school teachers. We need to let the teachers teach. 1965, George Romney and Bill Milliken, my hero, signed PARA. Public Employee Relations Act. This book was published. Dr. Willis Dunbar, Western Michigan. Michigan leads the way in public education is one of the lengthiest chapters in this book. It was the text for all Michigan history classes in 1965 when I was in high school. This is not the legacy Mike Flanagan nor any of you want to leave. We need to restore. It would break Kathleen Strauss's heart if this is the way, we're going to be known, as evidenced by the Washington Post article last Friday, Dr. Albrecht. We need to restore the greatness of Michigan once again and lead the way in public education. Michigan's children deserve the best, and we are going to give them the best. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Tedra Jackson, followed by Ann Jones and a group of students. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I wish I was here to talk about charter schools, but <laughs> sadly I missed the free press article, so um, I'm, I don't have anything on that. My name is Tedra Jackson, and I work for the Michigan Developmental Disabilities Council. Um, our council is a 21-member body appointed by the governor to advocate for better quality of life for persons with disabilities. Um, I staff our council's work group along with a co-worker, Tracy Vincent, on um, family. And we, with several of our partner organizations, are advocating for universal education across Michigan. In 2003, the council took its initial position on universal education. And um, in 2013, we wanted to renew, the council wanted to renew its support for the issue and recommit it to advocating for schools across the state. The document in front of you is being used statewide by advocates and parents. It's designed to introduce families, legislators, school administration, and personnel to the principles of universal education. We we, the council, believe full implementation of universal education will result in better outcomes for students, which will in turn benefit all Michigan communities. Universal education honors the rights of students to learn together in an environment that assures access to resources and provides supports to all students. The principles of universal education reflect the belief that each person deserves and needs a concerned, accepting educational community that values diversity and provides a comprehensive system of individual supports from birth to adulthood. Please turn to page six. There you will find the council's position that was, up, uh, that was renewed last year. And now please turn to page eight. In 2005, the State Board of Education showed their support for universal education by adopting the vision and principles of UE. The diagram on page eight is a depiction of how society should work together to educate everyone 
all children together all the time. Cooperation between the Department of Community Health, Michigan Department of Education, and Department of Human Services can result in wrapping services around students that promote inclusive schools and improve student achievement. Um, we're asking that you distribute this document electronically to all superintendents of all school districts, including charter schools. And we're also requesting that this document be posted along with the State Board's Education, the State Board of Education's Vision and Principles on the Michigan Department of Education website. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And we have extra copies and um, we'll leave them on the table outside of the room. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ann Jones. They're coming into the room right now. While they're gathering, does anyone else have a public participation form they'd like to turn in? Other than the suit. Sure. Right. Well, as soon as this presentation concludes, we'll go into the second portion where you can offer your comments on the superintendent search. Before you start that, welcome back, Yvonne. Good to see you. Welcome back. First, I think we've seen you in your not new role anymore, but in your current role. I am. Um, I'm passing things out. It's uh, something I actually am qualified to do. <laughs> how are you? Good to see you. Good to see you. I'm Mrs. Strauss, how are you? Good to see you again. Good to see you. Hi. This wasn't meant to be a reception Thank you. line. <laughs> what are you doing? Anytime Thanks, I can Yvonne. get a couple of uh, minutes know. with you, Mike. Good to see you. You might want to know that I do have a favorite in this group. Yeah, we know. Thank you. Know. <laughs> I think you'll find out a couple. <laughs> Can I begin? Is that okay if we begin? Yes, Okay. please. Um, thank you for inviting us uh, to share how IB works in Lansing School District. I'm Emily Oberlitner, so I'm the IB coordinator at Lansing Eastern High School. And I'd like to introduce some of our adults. So Superintendent Yvonne Kamal Kamul is in the back. And we also have our principal um, of Eastern High School, Donna Pohl, and our principal of our elementary school, um, Kamala Diaz, and also the IB coordinator for the elementary, which is Ann Jones. Um, and I'm going to let the students introduce themselves, so I'm just going to give a brief overview, and then they're going to talk for themselves and explain. So we are very excited and proud to offer the um, IB programs at all three levels in the Lansing School District. We have the primary years program at Post Oak, and that also includes Chinese Immersion. Um, at Eastern High School, this will be our first year to offer Chinese Immersion and the Middle Years program, and we also have the Diploma program for the 11th and 12th graders. Um, our learning environment at Eastern, at, at Eastern and at Post Oak Elementary School is very diverse, and it is challenging, but we view our IB um, programs as an opportunity for all of our students uh, to develop critical thinking skills and ways in which to make the world a better place. 大家好,我是宋年,三个新中国最去Eastern高中最去年纪,在IB学习的最要归年中,最年新容我们的古统。so now what I said in English. Um, <laughs> good afternoon. <laughs> um, my name is Claire Hips. Um, in about three weeks, I will be going t into seventh grade at Eastern High School. Um, the learner profile attribute that describes me the most is probably communicator. In 2020, um, or later, I guess, I plan on attending college, i.e. MSU, and then transferring <laughs> out to um, John Hopkins School of Medi Medicine and to become a neonatologist. Um, I know that by doing IB in high school, um, it will definitely help me to achieve these goals. And then I was also asked to speak a little bit about the projects. So um, IB also has many projects um, because the program is project-based project -based learning. Um, last year I completed the last project in the PYP, the primary years program, um, the exhibition, the exhibition, and all of the other projects that I will ever complete in um, PYP and MYP will um, help to prepare me for the DP, the 
the diploma program and college. The point of the exhibition was to research an issue in the world and after that complete an action that will help to prevent this issue locally. Last year I completed my exhibition on, or project on world hunger. After researching causes such as poverty or war, we created baskets for starving children at Pattengill um, Academy, the school I went to previously. Um, all of the projects that I complete in IB will help me to further understand the world and all of the people in it. Um, with every project in IB I complete and I get much closer to achieving my goals of college and other things. <laughs> Thank you. Um, hi, my name is Maja Kamara. I'm a sophomore at the University of Michigan. So. Go Blue! Yeah. <laughs> um, and I can honestly say that the reason I was able to achieve that fee is because of the IB program at the uni or at Eastern High School. Um, we had the classes were the most difficult classes I took at that time. We also had to extend the essay, cast project, and other things that other students would talk about, but. Doing all those extremely difficult things truly prepared me, and not just like academically, but it also like helped me make a really awesome college application with volunteer experiences. And I don't know there's just so many things that IB did for me. Um, the most influential class I definitely took at IB was my IB biology class, which I wouldn't have taken unless I did full diploma. And due to taking that class, even though I hated it. It was so difficult. I cried when I found out I had to take it. <laughs> I was, I'm so happy I took it because I loved it. The teacher was amazing. And now like, I'm probably going to go into like, energy policy because of that class. And the whole reason I was able to do that was because of IB. So I definitely can see a direct impact on my life because of IB. So yeah. Great. Um, good afternoon. My name is Madison Jones. I graduated in 2014, so just in uh, May, and I did end up earning the IB diploma, and I will be attending the University of Michigan in the fall. Go so blue. blue. Oh, wow. Good luck. Wow. Wow. <laughs> the embarrassment of Richard. <laughs> um, so today I'm going to be explaining CAS to um, you all. So CAS stands for Creative Action and Service, and essentially it's a 150-hour service project that IB diploma students complete during their junior and senior year years and um, one point that I want to bring up is the difference between CAS and National Honor Society for many of us we were involved with both and I noticed um, a distinct difference that with NHS I was just doing service just to complete the requirements for NHS whereas CAS it was a lot more genuine and passionate service it was creating something of your own that you really were invested in not just volunteering for the sake of volunteering it was something that you wanted to do um, so for example my CAS project a large part of it was creating the Quaker pet band. Um, I was I was in marching band, and we played at the football games, but there were no, there was no band to play at the basketball games. And even now, we're one of the only schools in the area to have a basketball pet band. And I created that my junior year. And in the beginning, it was kind of slow. We had like a drum set and like a flute. It didn't sound very well. <laughs> but, uh, but this past year, um, one of the other students got involved, and he started writing music. And we had a lot more people, and it was really really great. And now, two sophomores who will do IB, they're planning on taking on as their own cast project so it's really cool to see something that you created as part of IB you know being integrated in the school and that's continuing on and that's not something that you would do through NHS you would just do hours to do hours with IB you're creating something that you love and you're invested in so I think it's really great. That's great. So, I just speak from standing? Okay. So my name Please. is Nicholas Kilpatrick I also graduated this spring and received the full diploma this fall, I will be attending Michigan State University Honors College. <laughs> so a little different. <laughs> and I will be briefly discussing our Theory of Knowledge course that is also a requirement for the IB Full Diploma track. Uh, it's our, what's officially titled, it's, it's an epistemology course. It's about how and why we know what we know. And our experience was that we took it as a zero hour course before school and regularly scheduled evening times where we'd come in and watch a movie and then discuss how that tracked into what we were learning and how different thoughts can be brought in. Like the first time I saw the Matrix movie was actually in class and we got to discuss how the characters knew like, what was real and what wasn't. And it was part of, we can relate things that are cultural to how we're learning things. And in this class we all play a really active role. It's not just passively absorbing information. It's primarily uh, discussion or um, prompted discussion where he'll say, what about this? And it's, really active role and actually one of the cool things about it is that we can learn the lessons that the course is about through pretty much any relevance like anything that 
we find helps us learn better. Like sometimes it'll seem really tangential, like we'll go off on some track that doesn't seem like what he was originally talking about, but it's, we're still learning the exact same lesson because theory of knowledge applies to everything. It's sometimes we talk about in context of the math class we had, sometimes it would be connecting our history course to our English course and how some of the subject there overlapped. Um, it's different from a lot of courses because it has that ability for fluid learning where you're not just on a syllabus, you're not just learning about this period of time and then this period of time. Everything kind of overlaps and interacts differently. So this course, at least for me, was it seemed it was more about the questions you asked and how you asked questions than the answers you received. And that prepares everyone for process-based learning and it prepares you to analyze everything. You're doing more independent learning because you're asking the right questions rather than learning because you're being told the right information. And this is, we conclude this course and it's being tested by a 1600 word essay that we write in the winter time. And then at the very end of the course, the last month or so, we all do presentations. I know uh, some people did individual presentations and those were about 10 minutes. And I did my presentation with this guy over here and we did, um, when it was two, two people presenting together, it was a 20 minute presentation and we did a presentation on a few different types of ethics in a conflict in a relationship and just looking at how you consider the different types of ethics in real world situations. And I'll go on to talk about the third uh, additional thing that's part of IB. My name is Benjamin Hoodie Velasco. I graduated in 2013 and I'm attending Western Michigan University, so not one of the big two, but still. <laughs> and I'll be talking about the extended essay. Now the extended essay is a 4,000 word research paper that you complete over two years, your junior and senior year. And it's much like the other two things, something that you're passionate about. You get to choose a topic in one of the three, or any, any of the classes that are offered through IB, and you get to start, um, research something in depth. I myself did mine on comparing the efficiency of traditional windmill design as, uh, with designs based on kinetic sculptures by a guy named Theo Jansen in the Netherlands. Um, and that was in the design science class, which we did not offer at Eastern, but even so I was able to find a teacher mentor, which is required to help me through um, the process. And the thing, big things that I learned through this was that uh, preparation is key to anything you do. Um, I didn't do the best job in researching during my junior year, and so I had to do a lot of catching up work in my senior year to get it done by the deadline. And I could tell that my preparation was not as full as it could have been when I did not get full scores for it, um, for my paper. With the extended essay, you get extra credit points in addition to the scores you receive from your classes, and so you can get a higher score if you do really well. Um, and so based on the fact that I didn't do my research really well, I didn't get any extra credit points. However, I was able to get the diploma because I did complete the paper and submit it. Um, so that, that is good. Additionally, in college, one thing that you hear a lot is they need to write a lot of papers, a lot of research papers. And I found this out actually my first year, which I just completed. Um, my, one of the classes my first semester had to write a research paper. And in that class, I was able to draw on a lot of the things that I learned from the extended essay and connect those back into the bridge paper I was writing for that class, which was also based on technology. Um, so the extended essay is a really important part of IB because once again, you're looking on something you're really passionate about and have to research that by yourself in depth and keep going for two years and make sure that what you're researching is, has enough information that you can adequately produce a quality product. First, I would just like to say that I also have a favorite. <laughs> <laughs> Um, my name is Kelly Graham, and I graduated from Eastern in 2011. I'm currently going into my senior year at the University of Michigan. Go blue. <laughs> Go blue. I'm majoring in women's studies as well as German with a minor in writing, and I'm also pre-med. Um, the most important thing that IB taught me was how to always go above and beyond and take learning into my own hands. I went to college with a plan with short-term and long-term goals, knowing exactly what I wanted to accomplish by the time I graduated. Although I did not receive my full IB diploma, I'm here to say that it's not the be all and end all. IB is about way more than the, the diploma, more than the courses, more than the test. For me, it was honestly, it's a lifestyle. Everything I did in school ultimately revolved around IB in high school, college, everything today. From the sports, the clubs, the community service, just being all around better person. IB taught me not how to only be a student, but always to be more than that. IB definitely prepared me for college, but not only that, for life in general. How to be a leader, how to be organized, how to manage my time, priorities, workload, to be organized, and to give back. 
without IB and everything it pushed me to be and do in high school, I honestly don't know if I would be where I am today or if I would have even survived these last three years at U of M. <laughs> and I just want to say that I owe all my accomplishments to this IB program, and I'm so thankful. So thank you for your time, and go Blue. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. And would you please, principals, and others, please introduce yourself. I know, we know you at some at the board table do not. Kamala Diaz, principal at Post Oak Elementary School, pre-K six, primary years program, and Chinese immersion language option. I'm Ann Jones, I'm the primary years program coordinator at Post Oak. Donna Pohl, principal Lansing Eastern High School, grades seven through 12. Thank you guys so Thank much. You. Thank exactly. you. Thank you. And, and I mentioned to you in the hallway that even though these folks have heard me talk about growing up in Brooklyn, New York, my mother met my father in New York. That's why we live there. But she's a proud graduate of Eastern High School. So we have that. Kind of <laughs> no Quakers. No Quakers, right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you all. Mascot is <clears throat> Thanks for taking the time. Your mascot is cool. Is there anybody else for public comment, general public comment? If not, we're going to move into public comment on the state superintendent search. I have three forms for that. They'll be in this order. Catherine Ash, Mark Dobiage, and Elizabeth Bauer. Liz Bauer to some of you, former state board member. So Catherine Ash, if you'd come to the table. Colleague, you, who you already know, because yeah, there are things to pass out. Yeah, <laughs> she has skills. Yvonne Kamal Canula is passing the document. Yeah, so she's she's the superintendent of Lansing School District. We like Lansing to be working for former Lansing. Michigan Department of Education former colleague employee. Here, former did a colleague, great job. Yes. Um, well, good afternoon. Um, thank you very much for giving us an opportunity to speak to you about um, what we view as the essential attributes of the state superintendent. A couple of things. My name is Dr. Catherine Ash, and I'm the superintendent of Okemos Public Schools. And uh, you, as you know, um, I'm here with Yvonne, the superintendent from uh, Lansing Schools. And we are here to represent uh, the Ingham County superintendents um, as we put this listing together. Um, it's a little awkward to be speaking about the essential qualities of a state superintendent. I think you have recognized them, um, and we um, thank and appreciate and value what you have done for the state of Michigan and education, Superintendent Flanagan. Um, and we have one more year of you, and that's, that's a good thing. Um, but we also want to be helpful to the board um, in their search uh, for the next individual. It's probably the most important thing you'll do as the board. Um, we are worried about the direction of public education in general and in Michigan specifically. We continue to allow politicians to frame the message. It is time that educators influence public opinion and more importantly, evidence-based practices and policies that will truly promote a quality educational experience for all students. With that said, the qualities of our ideal candidate. A strategic planner. To develop, communicate, and implement a strategic plan for Michigan's public education system that will guide the conversations, policy development, and MDE's program oversight and administrative regulations. An instructional leader with deep instructional knowledge and the ability to collaborate and empower and understands and promotes evidence-based practices. Reflective. The ability to reflect on practice, to analyze outcomes, to identify unintended outcomes, to adjust practices and policies accordingly, work to achieve uh, the intended outcomes, have the ability to recognize personal strength and surround self with others of expertise with, in different areas, um, both within the department and within the state. High expectations, the individual hold high expectations and, and is committed to committed, I'm sorry, committed to continuous improvement as we work toward the common goal of educating all, both in the field and at MDE. A balanced approach. Uh, the individual recognizes the power of data to inform decisions, inform instruction, and promote continuous improvement, recognizes the limitations of data to categorize schools and districts, implements a rational lens to ensure intended outcomes, and understands public education at the local level, recognizes that one size doesn't fit all, nor does it accurately depict all. Create a positive culture. It works to establish a positive culture in Michigan and at the Michigan Department of Education for teaching and learning. Communicates respect, values experiences and expertise of practitioners, collaborative, creates a safe environment for teaching and learning. Research shows that a positive work environment generates the highest quality outcomes. 
The constant attack on the teaching profession, establishing a competitive environment, establishing punitive practices are all contrary to the research on collaboration, problem solving, and professional growth. We can and will work toward continuous growth and improvement, but we cannot continue to dissuade committed, talented individuals from joining or remaining in the educational profession. The superintendent of the state needs to believe this, live this, and promote this. We want them to be a learner, a courageous leader, a visionary, and put Michigan students first. So thank you. And thank you. On behalf of Bingham County Superintendent. Yes, we appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Mark Dobiash, please. Mark Dobiage and then Liz Bauer. Okay. Sorry, I could be projecting better. My name is Mark Dobiash. I'm the superintendent of the Allegan Area Educational Service Agency, and I'm also the president of the Michigan Association of Intermediate School Administrators. And I want to uh, also appreciate this opportunity to speak to you today. And I would agree with everything that you just heard. <laughs> I think they stated um, it very, very well and very, very articulately. I would like to highlight a few of those key attributes if I can. Um, I think it's very important that the state superintendent have the default position uh, in decision making of what's best for kids. I know that's really simply stated, but we want to have someone that looks up for the best interest of students. Um, and not necessarily those of adults or businesses or corporations or that sort of thing. Uh, background experience in education is highly important. We would like to see someone who has ex extensive experience in being a superintendent. Uh, a superintendent from this state would be great, but uh, a superintendent with a deep knowledge of instructional practice and what is, the, what is the best instruction for kids and what promotes the best learning outcomes for kids. Uh, it's important that the next state superintendent be highly aware of the issues, both on the political arena, but the issues that are facing schools on an everyday basis, the overabundance of regulations and uh, mandates that are causing problems, and, and seek to expose those mandates that are causing problems for our schools. Um, a, Probably the most important thing I want to talk about is something that Superintendent, Superintendent Flanagan started with the Michigan Association of Intermediate School Administrators, and that's something we call the Darkening the Dotted Lines Initiative. Uh, Mike started that back in 2005 with the goal of being collaborative and increasing the collaboration between Michigan Department of Education and MAISA to better serve the schools in the states. Uh, it's worked in reducing duplication and helping to solve problems along the way. Uh, it's, we created a partnership matrix outlining the responsibilities of both MAISA and MDE. And we've had some achievement initiatives including developing supports for priority schools, early childhood expansion, early college seat time waivers, uh, accountability and school improvement models. Um, there's a standing committee that's been established for administrative services that deal with pupil accounting, the manual, and the training going along with it. Um, and it's a standing meeting that meets four times a year. Uh, Susan Broman and Bill Miller from MAISA jointly set the agenda. I've had the opportunity to sit on that. It's been very valuable time, and I think it serves you very well. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. And our final speaker, Elizabeth Bauer. Hi. Thank you. My name is Elizabeth Bauer. I live at 725 West Breckenridge Street in Ferndale, Michigan, and I'm here representing myself. And I have already submitted to you extensive comments on the qualities and uh, characteristics of a future superintendent, but I came this afternoon because I want to emphasize two in particular. One is commitment to inclusion, and the second is commitment to collaboration. And when I talk about inclusion, uh, of course, I'm talking about what uh, the Development of Disabilities Council people describe to you as full inclusion in our schools where we make the curriculum accessible to all learners. I would expect our new leader to be committed to that policy framework and direction that the board approved in 2005 and make that happen. But the inclusion I want to talk about this afternoon is a, is a broader inclusion. 
it's an it's an inclusion of persons and organizations beyond the educational community in the planning for educational services in this state. I think when you look at the states that are performing well, you will notice that their policy direction is informed not just by the uh, educational community at large, but by the people who use the graduates of the educational system and who set the bar high and say, this is the person we want. We want someone prepared not only to the, do the job of today, we want them to do the job of tomorrow. So uh, <laughs> someone who can come committed to including a broader community, I think, would be uh, important to the transformation of public education in this state. The second quality I wanted to emphasize is collaboration. It's been mentioned by other people uh, at this table today. I really hope you'll look for a person who has demonstrated ability to create a culture of collaboration, both within the workplace and in the broader community. Um, Michigan has been described by at least one federal official as the most siloed state in the nation. That's not terribly complimentary, and I think it, if we are truly that, we have cut ourselves off from a lot of input that could uh, transform our educational system and to better prepare our young people uh, for the 21st century. So I would like to see someone who's really committed to work to create a culture of collaboration within this department, between the departments of state government, with the business and industry and the people that have the jobs and the higher education and career development opportunities so that our, our young people are ready to take full advantage of them. Our current system has much too much duplication in it. We have layers of administrative overhead. When we talk about the $13 billion, how much of it is going to uh, uh, administrative overhead and not to the classroom and the, and the student uh, who's there? We need to direct our efforts so that the most resource goes to where the, where the student is and the frontline people that are supporting that student as a whole person social, emotional, work training, and academic, all those things. I'm not going to detail all the duplicative structures. You can probably name them yourselves. Um, I, I was thinking maybe you should just look for Joshua, who could fight the Battle of Jericho and the walls come tumbling down. But um, you have a great opportunity. Mike has given you a very generous uh, notice. And uh, you have time to conduct an extensive search. So I'm hoping you will look for a leader who's demonstrated the ability to take giant steps, who's willing to wade in the deep water, to take risks, and more importantly, the, willing, uh, the ability to bring others along on a dare, daring <laughs> devil trip. Uh, an individual committed to inclusion and collaboration will bring change agents to the table and purposefully engage them in common effort to transform public education. Michigan, um, in public education in Michigan, we can successfully prepare young people for the jobs of today and tomorrow. It is possible. It can be done. And our future is in your hands. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you all. That concludes public participation. Thank you. I'm going to work on some of those in my last uh, <laughs> days here. Um, we're going to do introduction of new employees, so I'm going to turn it right over to the deputy <coughs> to do so. Good afternoon, everybody. It's my pleasure to kick it off. Um, I want to do Amy Alanis from our Office of School Support Services. Uh, I'd love to have her tell a little about herself and what she uh, is working on with the department. Hi, I'm Amy Alanis. I am a school district consultant with the Coordinated School Health and Safety Programs Unit here in the department. Um, the area I am primarily working on is um, school safety issues, and right now we're working on some grants, including an emergency management grant. So um, still getting kind of like that, but everything school safety will be involved in. Okay. 
to introduce Rachel Malama on the Office of Great Start. I'm Rachel Malama. I work in the Early Childhood and Family Services area of the Office of Great Start. I work primarily with the 32B Black Grant, which works with the Great Start Collaborative and Coalition for State Aid and Federal CCDF funds to work with early childhood birth through age 8. Today. Excuse me for that. Thank you guys. Welcome to the team. Can we Thank give them up? Glad you're on board. Thanks so much. Sorry, I missed that first part. Okay, we're headed into approval of State Board of Ed minutes. Um, that's item E um, of the June 17th meeting. Do I have a motion, please? So moved. Approved by Kathleen, supported by John. Any discussion, corrections, et cetera? All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, same. Great, thank you. President's report, Mr. Austin. Thank you, Liz Bauer. You're, thanks for coming, Liz. Um, you, you suggested a next superintendent who likes to wade in deep water or comes snorkeling out of a pool. Sounds like Governor Snyder to me. Craig, do you think you'd want to come over here and take this job? I doubt it. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, we'll see how the election goes. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, I want to talk about two things. One is the examination of school finance and organization and the overhaul that we are wanting to uh, work on and bring forward our ideas for. Uh, and the other is, I, I'm going to say, for my pieces of encouragement and my piece of my charter school as we get into that discussion, and then I promise I won't repeat uh, later this afternoon. But um, we took a break uh, this month because we sort of finished our uh, hearing from a lot of different, both experts and stakeholders, about what's broke with the way we organize and finance schools, what do other states do differently, better, what are directions for change. Uh, there was an article or column over the weekend, um, some of you may have seen it, Nancy Kaffer in the Free Press saying, when did Michigan stop caring about its schools? And why isn't anyone in Lansing talking about our broken school funding system and mm -hmm. noting that it's not going away and even well-managed districts are under stress? And uh, I want to reassure Nancy, I want to reassure all of us that um, we are serious and we need to be serious about continuing that conversation. Um, we are going to start uh, wrestling with all that we've heard and coming for the next week ahead so that after the election we can make our recommendations about uh, what kind of major changes uh, we recommend to the governor and legislature and the way we organize and finance schools to deliver better outcomes. I mean, to some of the folks who are talking in the context of charter schools, that is the whole point of everything that we need to be about, is how do we produce the outcomes we want, including, you know, Nancy's piece was saying uh, small items, big items, uh, the failure of the Wayne County millage as an example that proposal these architects thought the ISD millage would be a way locals could raise more money and it just didn't work politically. Only three people have been able to do it. So it's one of the pieces of change and that we need to propose. And I'm not saying that we are headed in this direction, but we'll find out if, if, if any of our recommendations just modeled what Massachusetts system looks like and we move to be more like Massachusetts, which has the best performing education system and one that performs really well for improving achievement and outcomes for poor and minority students. They don't have nearly as many of those, but they do better at helping them move forward. Uh, and some of us heard Paul Ravel when he was in town at the MSU talk about their system. And Massachusetts and our system have the same high standards that we're setting out for all of our learners but uh, they do more to invest in the capacity of teachers and schools to meet those standards. They spend more money where money is needed with young people who have greater needs, who are in poverty, who have further to travel. They disproportionately put resources behind students and schools where they need uh, to go further. Uh, and they have a very coherent and effective choice charter policy that has uh, softened the financial blow for districts where people and bodies leave uh, so you don't get these rapid ups and downs in terms of school finance, which are whipsawing our system. And they have really high quality control. And Paul said it, they don't open new charters unless they're innovative or a new choice that's of quality. Uh, and charters are treated differently under their system. 
and I want to come back to that as we talk about charters. The ways in which charters, we must treat charters the same as our yeah. traditional public schools and where we must treat them differently. Yeah. But if we model the Massachusetts system, which is the best performing, you know, those are changes that we need to consider and move ahead with. So we're going to make our recommendations, and I'm looking forward to working with all of you towards those. Um, there is, thanks to the generosity of Michigan's uh, philanthropy, there is an independent study that our, some of our major philanthropies are underwriting for the W. Upjohn Institute from Kalamazoo with Mike Adonisio, former Governor John Engler's uh, education advisor, are working together on a totally independent, not uh, at all informed or directed by me or anyone else, looking at the same issues, what's broken our system, what other states do different and better, and what are the five or eight or ten major policy and changes in the way we organize and finance schools. They're going to be releasing their report after the election. Uh, and there will be then, I think, at least two very thoughtful uh, texts and guides for the big changes that we need to make. And I, I trust there will be others. I'm sure other groups and other voices will be shaping this and should. What is the agenda for overhauling the system so that we are clearly answering the, the criticism or the question, when did we stop caring about our schools? And we've got to do some major things to fix the system. Um, on, on charters, and we're going to have a very good discussion. I appreciate the Legislative Committee bringing forward some uh, thoughtful recommendations of the direction of change that we need to continue. Uh, there are lots of good charter schools, lots of excellent charter schools. Some of the folks who I know we heard from. But th we've known for some time, and certainly the Free Press series made very clear, our charter law needs some comprehensive overhaul. We've developed big problems in our system of education around charters, around transparency, around accountability and policing, bad behavior, and illegal behavior, and around quality control. And these are issues that we need to, no matter what Mike is able to do, which is coming in terms of under existing law, I think there needs to be and will be various proposals for legislative remedies to make clear how we can improve the system and to be very clear about how we have better transparency, better accountability, and better performance in the charter domain but against the context of all schools. And I, I am disappointed in the charter school advocates and the charter school lobby, many of whom I've worked with, for not reacting to this series and our own work by saying, yeah, we've got some big problems, let's fix them. It's been more, no, nothing's wrong. We don't have any problems. And this is coming from someone, as Dan and others know, I've been a pro-charter quality charter person. I've worked nationally on projects with the U.S. Department of Education to expand high quality charter schools around the country. I've raised hundreds of thousands of dollars for high quality charter schools. And But I am serious about making sure the charter movement lives up to its original potential. And we've got real challenges, which we need to fix in Michigan, uh, around uh, it doesn't, the system has not policed itself, clearly. And we've had elimination even two years ago when the cap was lifted on university sponsored charters, a sensible or at least in the right direction approach to provide some quality control. Let's not open more new bad schools, a smart cap. Let's not let, let bad schools replicate. That was purposely lifted and rejected no quality control. All quality control was rejected. So more damage has been done over the last few years. So we need to use this opportunity to revisit these issues and try to develop some quality. And I will say, and from my point of view, charters need to be treated exactly the same as traditional public schools around transparency, and that's actually why we need legislation to insist that when we, there are for-profit operators, they're not hiding them how they spend taxpayer dollars, just like traditional public schools don't hide, so they need to be treated the same. Charters need to be treated the same around accountability, both policing illegal behavior and treated exactly the same around shutting them down or ending their, their ability to operate if they're getting bad academic performance, just like the other schools. We have to treat, and we have to be serious about closing down our existing public schools if they don't perform, because we have to be serious about making sure our charters are performing, but we have to treat them the same. Where we have to treat them differently, in my view, is when we're starting new schools. I mean, we just can't afford as a state what we have seen, which is more new schools created if they don't educate kids well, if even they look bright and shiny and people choose them. 
and the kids don't get an education, those kids lose. Dollars flow to those bad performing schools that aren't available for other schools and their education is diminished. It's a lose-lose situation. So when we open new schools or replicate schools, we have to insist on a higher standard, just like Massachusetts does. So that's my piece, and I look forward to Cassandra leading the discussion about what kind of recommendations we would make to the legislature and the governor. Thanks. Thank you, John. In my report, I've said the last few times, I'm, I appreciate Liz saying it's the most important decision you're going to make is, is the new superintendent because there's so many day-to-day -day things that are decided that are in many ways more important than the visible things you see. And it's one reason I've been trying to give you a bit of an array of what those are like. I've also done that with a lot of folks have talked to me about the, about the prospect of this. And I'm, I'm very encouraging to folks from different backgrounds. I, I have said, and, and you can trust me on this, that even though they said, well, the board doesn't always, you know, I said each and every board member has agreed with me on issues and each and every board member has not agreed with me on other issues and that's that's part of life that but I full I feel full support and feel that you recognize my responsibilities and as long as you see that on balance I'm carrying them out the way that's appropriate for a state soup I feel I've been very supportive because that's important to a candidate they want to know you know they're going to be hanging out there and especially when in effect you have an at-will contract I mean that's been a surprise to many people they thought I had a 10-year contract and secondly, they don't realize that after the Schiller kind of, what would we call it, debacle, that, that the law was changed and there can't be buyouts and all the rest of that, which I think is appropriate at this position. So, um, But I would, I would say there is a but in here. I'm trying to not say but as often, my wife's advice, but um, <laughs> I think the challenge for the board as it is for me when we do our own hires is trying I mean for example I think the the list given to you was outstanding the comments made and others you've received it's trying to see if they're really in the person who's interviewing and it's a very hard thing to do I've done it for years I've done it with I've hired 25 principals years ago and other positions it's very hard to un reveal what's really there. For instance, I don't think people do this consciously, but I probably even in saying what we've done at the department sometimes leave the feeling kind of, I did that at the department. Well, you're part of all of that, but I think a lot of it is trying to drill down to those real qualities. I would say there's also be willing to, frankly, not be liked and be able to take, like last night, I had a tough night with the, the Twitter stuff. I couldn't have looked at it. it was pretty painful and it's pretty personal um, it's much more in this job I've been in every kind of job as you know that you can think of it's just by a hundred because of the nature of decisions you make that if I had to pick is the number one thing I didn't have some of you called me on this about five years ago and I think I've gotten better I hope I have which is that I it requires thick skin um, and and so those are just a few general things I do think that um, I just wanted to mention a few things this past, well, this week alone. Obviously, the within my, my little lane, frankly, of just taking on, uh, in the spirit of what John said, a charter issue for expansion, um, we've made some progress there. Uh, the EPI stuff today, that I think you could see from the work done, and it also includes the superintendent. I mean, so I wouldn't want, for those that I kind of jokingly said thought this, there are people who said to me, this is like a ceremonial job, right? And the other people run the department. Not really. Um, so those are important things that take a lot of time. And then tomorrow, we'll be releasing the top to bottom list, as we do every year at this time. The schools have had them for a couple of months. Um, it's what I know there's been some discussion in the last day or so about what metrics are we using. As I said this morning, the metric we're using on the portfolio of charters is the same metric we use in for, for those things, it's the top to bottom, and then we're going to meet with the authorizers before any final time on what other metric would give credit for improvement. Because I think even if you've been willing to take on kids that are in kind of a bottom 10% atmosphere, if you're getting improvement, we should reward that. And yet, on the other hand, if you're in a bottom 10% and over the years it's still going down, that's a problem. So th those have been pretty big decisions that have involved me and the staff quite a bit. But just some odds and ends that aren't really small. I mean, approving 31, 31B year-round school grants, some, contra, uh, some, some challenges in that, actually. 
Um, one was deciding what not to do. Um, I got some feedback from some of you after I decided mm, maybe not a good time to do governance task force. Um, well intentioned, but that's probably for others to do, and I think the timing would be bad, especially in my last year. Um, discussed with team our communication plan for keeping local districts and others informed of the changes to state assessments over the next two years. It's very worrisome. And it's one of the things you also have to be willing to have in this job is responsibility for things you can't control, even though things people think you can. I mean, we can't tell you. I joked it off earlier this morning, but I really can't tell you what we're going to do exactly for the new MEEP. We will have one that aligns to the Michigan standards, Common Core, and we will have one that is in the spring, and it will also have a computer uh, uh, online side to it. But it's it's some of that uh, ambiguity that one has to be able to live with. I think you, you'll see, you've seen a little bit of it today. There's always pressure. I feel it every day. It's the combination of we want you to be a cheerleader, but you're also implementing reforms by law that almost make you, by definition, appear to not be a cheerleader. I'll say that again. I mean, you know, my daughter's a teacher. I don't value, no one can, I don't think people can tie me, but can't over uh, emphasize my respect for people who take on the teaching profession, but you're even in a spot where you can fight certain initiatives, lose the war, and then you're obligated to carry them out. So it's someone who has to be able to live with that in a way that can be painful at times. It's just the way it is. Um, obviously the charter stuff, deficit. Def <laughs> Kyle's learning quickly, but these deficit elimination plans, which we are required by law, I, we would have and have proposed amendments to the way that law reads. We, we are perceived to have a lot more of an authority on that than we do. So there's some, but it's, it's an important work and it, I think it ultimately has to do with uh, more at-risk money for districts that are most in need and we will be proposing that in our budget. The whole state reform district issue I think is important. We have a good leader in our new one, uh, Natasha Baker, but there's a lot to be done there. We work on that continually. EPI scores, I mentioned. Um, USED, it's never ending. <laughs> it's never ending. It's a major component. And even today, I could hear a little bit of blowback on things, again, that are perceived to be either the boards, the superintendents, or the department's initiative. When it is, you're carrying out federal law. And, and it's important to do so. I mean, we are law abiders, last I know. Um, and most of those I think I genuinely support. I do think we need to have done most of what's in there, but <coughs> a lot of work behind it, especially for the team here. Michigan Teacher Corps, we're trying to develop people to get into the profession because they have felt beat up, and uh, it can have an impact on the supply and demand. Review and discuss input received at the, assess the assessment um, public hearing that we had last week. That's an ongoing project, and we need to take it seriously and work through it. Review information related to this year's accountability release, which, as I said, is coming out tomorrow. Uh, we, we approved SIG grants, uh, decided on an MSU appeal that I mentioned yesterday. A highlight, actually, yesterday was that leadership team were trying to do what is happening quite often here, which are students right at our meeting, kind of breaks it up, makes us realize there's a reality to what we're doing. It has to do with those young people from Eastern today. Yesterday we had some very energetic teachers, I would say, from DeWitt, who head up uh, what's called the Michigan Creativity Group, spent an hour with our team. I think it was unsettling a little bit, perhaps, but I think we need to be in a spot where we understand the way it looks from a classroom teacher's point of view and how we can actually accommodate that. And then I think they also left, we went back to my office for a while, understanding some of this is what I said earlier, you're carrying out laws, so what you need to do is affect your legislators when you want to have an impact on that. You can talk to us to your blue in the face. Um, overall, I would say this, and I'll stop now, but. It's, I appreciate the opportunity. It's, it's an opportunity of a lifetime to be in this position. And I, I know you're taking it seriously. I've reported this to everyone. They said, is it a done deal? I said, I don't think so. I mean, you never, 
I mean, I really don't think so here. <laughs> <laughs> what I was ready to say is, it is not. It you know, yeah. Guaranteed. And, you know, so you can see, but those are concerns to applicants that uh, will you be supported? Are you going to immediately be thrown under the bus? And is it done? I said, supported, yes. Um, not always total agreement. That's life. And then, and then, um, no, this is why they're doing an authentic search. And I think you need to, if you're interested, get Bob. So that's my report for the month to try to keep to those things. And now, ladies and gentlemen, drum roll. <laughs> our first report from our talented teacher of the year. Melody, if you'd like to take over, please. Have we resolved our technical difficulties? No. Oh, but I can do without it. We're okay. tripping her up a little yeah. bit. This is a test. <laughs> <laughs> I can always share it next time, too. The teachers are good on their feet. You need the screen on? Okay. okay. So we did resolve. It's coming. It's just not quick enough for us. What's actually loading up right now is Dan Quisenberry's podcast, right, Dan? I know you infiltrated our system. Uh, the NEA just left room and said I could speak on their behalf. That's what's going on. <laughs> 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 yeah, that's clever. That is sense of humor. Yeah. Is <laughs> that so your comment book in there? Okay. There we go. Well, I first just want to say that it's a privilege to be at this table, so thank you for having me. It's been a thrilling ride already since May, and I can't wait to see what the next school year will bring. I spent a lot of time this summer building a website, and I did that because I want to be able to share this experience with other teachers across Michigan. And I also wanted to have information out there about things that um, I'm passionate about, my experiences, and also um, things that I might be able to contribute to different districts and different educational organizations around the state. So I was going to walk you through it a little bit, but that's where we're having the technical difficulties. I'll try it one more time, but no, it seems to be blocked. <laughs> So, uh, the, the first page that I have here just shows the general overview. No, I think it's stuck, so just bear with me for a minute. You know, I think just what I would say in fairness to DTMB, because of some of the security breaches, I think they're literally sorting out what's allowed to come through. Gotcha. And get in and out of our system. That's a little bit of a It's not this. It's the bigger. I'm going to try to pull this up again. Have we maxed out the grandchildren count? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sure he's Why got some more in there. <laughs> well, I don't have to use <laughs> the system for that. I can get my while. direct yeah. video in. I'm giving it to one minute now. <laughs> All right, I think I have it up. So I tried to follow suit with former Michigan Teachers of the Year, and I took a look at each of their websites to see what they offered, and I uh, did a lot of the same things. So I have the home page here, and then in the about page, I just share some of my experience and my background, and also some of the things that I hope to accomplish in my role as Michigan Teacher of the Year. I also have a blog here. And since I am considered a voice for the 100,000 teachers of Michigan, I definitely don't want it to just be my own. And I'd like to have an avenue for teachers to speak up and to um, be open about their struggles and their celebrations and different things that they would like brought to light. So that's what I hope the blog will be for. I also have a media page where I've included some different uh, videos, like the day of the announcement, and some different um, news outlets that have run stories, and also some newspapers, which I'll share. And then I have an events page where I'll be adding pictures and video from different events that will be taking place through the year. For example, tomorrow I'll be working with uh, the Galileo Leadership Academy on their return to Yarrow Conference. And then also in November, I'll be working with Gross Point um, Schools 
as their keynote speaker for the November 4th Professional Development Day. So I'd like to document those things and include them in the website so people can see the different work that's being done um, to represent teachers. And also there's a contact page uh, for people who might be interested in that sort of work. So I talked a little bit about the media already and um, the former Michigan Teacher of the Year who said hello to everybody. Um, <laughs> he put together uh, a team of teachers that worked with uh, people at the WDIV station and it was a whole segment about preparing for back to school early and what parents and, teach or what parents and students can do to uh, get in that back to school mode. And this was a few weeks ago but actually they ended up at my house yesterday uh, with an hour's notice. <laughs> so I learned to, you know, have the house clean and, and have the kids bathe early on, just in, just in case Channel 4 calls. Um, so they did run another story yesterday um, about the same topic with just a little bit of a different spin. So that's been fun, and there's been a lot of interest from media, and there was a Channel 7 um, news story that you showed at the last meeting as well. And then uh, there's been a few radio interviews, like Channel um, 96.3, I should say, with Blaine and Allison in the morning, um, an interview with Cynthia Canty from Stateside, and also with Greg Bowman from Making the Grade on WWJ. And I say that the beauty of this role is really that suddenly people take an interest in what you have to say. <laughs> <laughs> and I have a lot to say about the high quality of public schools and the hard work and the dedication of the teachers in the public school system as a product of public schooling myself and also with my children in the school where I work. Um, that's definitely one of my goals this year is to highlight that and um, stay focused on the positives that are happening in our system. So that's really what I've tried to emphasize and these were some of the print interviews, um, some different local magazines and uh, media outlets that were interested in just sharing the story of the Michigan Teacher of the Year process. Rolling Stone is next, they'll be calling. <laughs> <laughs> Fingers crossed. <laughs> so um, academically, one of the things that I'm really passionate about is reading instruction, uh, especially in relation to reading comprehension with a strong emphasis on metacognition. So that's one area where I'd like to focus on academically this year. Um, but when I think about socially, and one thing that I've always said that if I had a platform to speak on, it would be bully prevention. So I'm hoping to use this role to really bring light to what I see as bullying in elementary school. So I know I didn't experience bullying until middle school. So when I became a third grade teacher and I saw it the first year, I thought it was probably pretty isolated. And then I saw the same thing the next year. And then the next year, and flash forward 12 years later, I can now tell you just about everything that's going to happen with the timing and with the types of students and with the responses of students. So bullying is something I've really spent a lot of time on and uh, doing research on and working with students. And what I've learned with third graders in particular, which I can say it usually happens at the end of third grades. After spring break, that's when the bullying really takes, um, kicks into high gear. So what I've concluded is that because the students don't identify themselves with the bully stereotypes they see on TV and in the media, you know, that kind of like big, mean student who's pushing people into lockers or the over-exaggerated <laughs> popular girl, you know, who's mean to everybody, uh, those don't really exist in elementary school. And really, in life, those don't really exist, where somebody's a bully all the time, as is portrayed. So when you try to tell a third grader that they're acting like a bully, they don't identify themselves with that, and they don't see their actions as bullying. So that's where I really started to make a change with the students and thinking about all of us have that uh, capability to act like a bully. So I'm actually um, in the process of publishing a book called Diary of a Real Bully. <coughs> and it's about identifying the bully in all of us, then making a change. And it's a children's picture book. And it's basically complete other than adding the illustrations to it. But it follows the story of a young girl who is basically the exact opposite of a stereotype for bullying, but she starts to see that her actions um, come across as bullying sometimes. And it's about realization of that. So that's something I'm really excited about um, to develop and complete this year and to have a voice in that bully prevention. And then finally, just something that this month that I'm excited for, as I mentioned, is the Galileo Teacher Leadership Academy. And I'll be facilitating a group tomorrow. And it's really about coming back to our roots, which follow uh, Stephen Covey's Seven Habits and all of the different foundations of the Leadership Academy that we spend time in in Yarrow, which is the way that the Academy kicks off. So this is a return to Yarrow, and that's what I'll be doing tomorrow.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mm. Excellent. Great start. Okay, we're heading right into the item of the day. Marty's going to come up here and kick it off, and then Cassandra is legislative chair, full uh, license to proceed as you see fit. And I know that John and Cassandra have sorted some of that out. So right. Marty, I, if you want to kick it off first. Yep, I have about a 37-minute presentation. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. The legislature has been um, on break for much of the summer. They're expected to come back in <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, the latter so part of August. <laughs> Um, where they will finally um, get to business, um, voting on legislation. We don't know what their agenda is yet at this time. Um, so really that's uh, about all I have to report. And I will, we did have a legislative committee meeting on the 6th of August where the uh, legislative committee did discuss uh, several, several items, several issues. Uh, the largest, of course, I will throw to Cassandra now to um, go over the statement on charter schools. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so the we did have a meeting on the 6th and the majority of the legislative committee voted to bring uh, these set of recommendations which are being passed around now to the full board for your consideration. The recommendations for legislative updates to charter school existing charter school law basically fall under three main areas. One is transparency, including uh, requiring full financial reporting regardless of the profit status of an, of an EMO, uh, an open bid process, and addressing conflicts of interest related to lease agreements. The second area falls under accountability, which includes clarifying authorizer suspension roles, um, other conflicts of interest, and preventing retaliation for whistleblower activity um, among either teachers, uh, board members, etc. And then the final area is under quality, and that includes uh, reinstating the smart cap, holding authorizers more accountable for the quality of the schools that they oversee, and creating a certificate of need um, process. So schools are opening in places where there's an actual need for schools to open as opposed to just anywhere at any time for any reason. Uh, some of these recommendations reflect the issues that were raised in the Free Press uh, series of articles, but many of them are simply reaffirming what this board has said in the past. A number of these recommendations, including the lease agreements, is something that we have discussed previously and have forwarded to the legislature um, throughout the last few years. So with that, I move to approve the Statement on Charter School Reform Draft August 8, 2014, legislative recommendations, uh, and welcome a second. Second. Moved by Cassandra, seconded by Kathleen for discussion. Um, so let's open that up for discussion. Eileen. At the Kathleen. legislative committee meeting, uh, I pointed out that a number of the charges that were made in the Detroit Free Press mm -hmm. article actually were covered by statute and asked for a delay until September. And I think that the response from the majority was that because legislation is being dropped right now, the board wanted to jump in and uh, support that. Because, uh, or to go ahead and make a statement, because the differences between my perspective and the statement that the majority of the board members prepared and voted on at the legislative committee is so different, I could see no ability. I mean, for one thing, I didn't want to send anything out until we had uh, gone through it and said, okay, statute indicates this, and uh, this is not uh, a situation that, that calls for new legislation. It's already in law. So uh, we didn't try to work through the differences that I had, uh, and I apologize for that, but it was comprehensively different, and the timetable was not possible for me to be able to participate. As a result, uh, Richard and I have prepared an alternate statement as a minority uh, should this move forward. So. Thank you. Kathleen. Well, I obviously disagree with, with Eileen. I think it's very important for us to reiterate our previous positions. We have brought these issues to the fore many times. The issue of transparency, the issue of uh, non for profit companies actually putting the information on their websites, where heretofore they've been saying they're private companies and they're not subject to the open meetings laws and they don't have to do that. 
our position is that, and we just, this was a position that was taken by this board, but it was, I think, a 4-4 board. It was always unanimously approved by the board, by successive boards. And I think it's important to say it again, that the transparency is required of all public, uh, public institutions, and charter schools consider themselves public schools. And, and uh, even for-profit companies have to comply with the public school laws. They say they want to have everything on an equal footing, an equal playing field. They're not playing by the equal playing field. So not that the, pu the traditional public schools are required to put all this information out there in the public, and it's important for the non for the for-profit companies to do the same. And as uh, John Love pointed out, at 78 percent of the schools, charter schools in Michigan, are run by for-profit companies, and that's a lot of money that they that they. So uh, it's, that's very important. The whole the whole issue of transparency uh, with the with the lease agreements with all of that is it's just critical. It's it's just been incomprehensible to me that 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 they could make as much money as they are making by renting their property that they develop over and over and over and over again. They get back their their investment over and over again. So it's it's, it's important that that be done and. The clarifying the requirements, and I'm glad that you are, Mike, that you are doing what you're doing with the, the authorizers, and that's that's important. But I think it's uh, it might be helpful to clarify that in for the legislation too, even, even though I think you do have the authority now, and I think we've thought that for a while. But I think all of these things, the 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 quality expectations. Uh, which we tried to get into the when, when they were considering the charter school legislation a year ago, we tried to get that into the legislation and it was ignored. Re I hope we do better this time and it won't be ignored. I think the free press articles have at least raised a lot of people's consciousness that wasn't raised before. Uh, they weren't aware of all these things before. So I think it's all of these recommendations I think are very worthwhile. And I certainly hope you support this proposal, this draft. I, I really, um, Kathleen, um, you've just attacked me personally. You've just attacked my integrity. I didn't say the things you said. Uh, but what I did say I is really important. Thank you. I appreciate I that. With you. No, well, but there's a difference between saying that this document has been approved by prior boards and that I'm wrong. So I just want to point out to you, this was what I was asking for when, we, when I asked for a delay to check it against the existing statutes. In law, MCL 380.5036M, wait, that's a mouthful, includes disclosure of a current list of teachers and school administrators working at the public school academy that includes their individual salaries as submitted to the Registry of Educational Personnel, copies of the teaching or school administrator certificates or permits, evidence compliance with criminal background and records check. In addition, copies of facility leases or deeds or both and of any equipment leases, copies of any management contracts or services contracts approved by the Board of Directors, and it goes on. And my point that I was trying to make is submitting this without ever checking it against existing law and saying it's not in law reflects poorly on the department and the board. It says that we're not doing our detail work. So that was all I ever asked for, was a momentary pause to actually stand back and say, gosh, what is in law, what's not being enforced, which is completely different than saying we need new laws because this is wrong. One is inflammatory, and one is saying to the legislature we're not doing our business. And that was all I ever asked for. Thank you. John. I gotta say, I in terms of the, the nature of what <laughs> we're doing here with this um, set of recommendations, it is, it is to and I think what, what has just ex happened with the Mike's proposals around increasing accountability, which engenders a debate, is that in law or not in law? Can you do it? Just on the second issue of accountability, it clearly suggests there is need and opportunity to clarify who does get to pull the trigger and take away authorization under what circumstances. Um, we certainly believe that we do need legislation if we're going to revisit the issues of quality control and I would note that these recommendations are not, they're more illustrative, they're not detailed, meaning we're saying there are a number of ways the legislature could fix the quality control issue. Here are three or four different ways or ways that that could be approached from a 
certificate of need to a reinstituted smart cap. We're not suggesting that which one is exactly the best answer. We're just suggesting that we need to find fixes through legislation, we believe, on these three issues and to kind of frame the agenda in terms of where the major fixes need to be made in our charter school legislation before, which is going to happen in two weeks, we begin to get 10, 20 bills introduced, perhaps from both sides of the aisle, with a variety of fixes. We're trying to do our job as a board and say, based on our past experience, our past recommendations, and our current digestion of where we do need clarification and legislation, uh, insisting on full transparency, uh, clarifying the issues of who gets to punish whom when people do bad things, is whose is it? Superintendent, ours, and quality control re-established versus tossed out. Those, I think, are areas of legislative need and certainly would help clarify and fix the problems in the legislation. Craig. Yeah, this morning, Mike, you said, <clears throat> I think you said, direct this to the charter industry. Take a deep breath. Uh, I would have offered you the same counsel before jumping into the fray yesterday. And I certainly think I would offer that same counsel to this board on resolutions that may or may not be paid any attention to in the legislature. We all know that. The key for the governor, and he's been consistent throughout this discussion, is equal playing field. That if we're going to impose new accountability or transparency standards for charters, let's make sure that they apply to the traditionals. No different standards. And if traditionals are indeed suffering from more regulation, more transparency, more reporting requirements, Let's get that equilibrium worked out, but, but not through a resolution that, as I mean, points to, it is missing some facts. And the statute, uh, the statute, I have read the same stuff that Eileen has throughout this for the last month. And it's clear that uh, in some of the journalistic reporting, uh, either the reporters were unaware of the 2011 statute to where it changes, or they chose to ignore it. Lupe, and then Michelle. Uh, I have a question to, um, to rough to the chair. Okay. You say that we have to fix it because if one is doing more than the other, there has to be a way to fix it. We're submitting something that we feel is going to fix it. Do you have a recommendation how to fix it? I think, man, yes, sir. <laughs> oh, um, Just take I a think deep breath requires, before you talk, but go ahead. It really <laughs> requires a very thoughtful task force commission group that includes a wide range of stakeholders. And this is not unlike uh, the financial insecurity or instability task force that I ran for the governor last summer. We had meeting after meeting. We had every player in the room. Uh, it, it's too big of an issue to boil down to a simple call for action. You got to you got to try to negotiate stuff before you enter the legislative fray. Otherwise, the contention will be such, Lupe, that you get nowhere. Does that answer you? Well, well, yes, I wasn't on the board. I've been on the board for a year and a half. But it sounds like this kind of discussion has been occurring for years, mm -hmm. and nothing has occurred to change the playing field, the unbalanced playing field. And so now we're bringing something to the table uh, to submit to the legislature that we feel is going to do something or at least start the discussion. Thank you. I think Michelle was next, and then Richard. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm just having a hard time understanding um, why anyone would oppose transparency. Um, and I think one of the main points of the transparency is because 80% of our charters are go to a for-profit, which is they just basically take the money and hand it over to a management company who then is not subject to FOIA or who argues they're not subject to FOIA. 
um, that is a big gap in transparency where the, pu the traditional public schools or charter schools that are not managed by these um, private companies in the same way are subject to. But And I think it's a huge uh, bite of, out of transparency that they are not subject to the Freedom of Information Act or claim that they are not. They're also, their employees are considered private employees under labor law under these. So they're not considered, so they take the public money, but then they claim that they're private employers. And so that's, that's not an equal playing field either because, um, and then when you have, uh, like, which happened recently where one, uh, a group, a charter school becomes unionized and then, oh, lo and behold, they just switch it and under the law, those same employees are considered to be employed by somebody else. I mean, there's, there's advantages um, that I think uh, that weigh in the favor of um, uh, some of these charter school management companies that are in the, that are not in the favor of, in my opinion, um, to the greater community, and uh, to be able to 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 do that. So I think that that's a clear area that we need to be able to hold charter schools or, that are managed in this way so that they're considered private, um, not public entities, that they need to fall more, more under the umbrella of some more accountability. Richard and then Eileen. Um, in Shakespeare's play Othello, <laughs> Othello was sent to uh, Cyprus to defeat the Turks. But while he was there, Iago, uh, who was jealous for some reason or another, uh, set the agenda by telling him half-truths about his wife. And of course the climax of the play is that Othello strangles the uh, innocent woman uh, in their bed. And uh, in, in the present drama, of course, the free press has played Iago. They have told half-truths and now, and here's the shame for MDE, the free press has now set the agenda. And it's a shame when a public, uh, rather when uh, uh, an outside corporation uh, like the free press, by telling half-truths, misreporting, and misrepresentation, sets the agenda for a public body like our State Board of Education. I think that's the, that's the tragedy uh, in the situation. Because like dealing with a child, if the only time you respond to a child is with negative behavior, you're unconsciously training your child uh, to be negative. So we should not have responded to the free press, except in a very measured and careful way. This is what Eileen asked the Legislative Committee to do, so that we don't look like fools calling for legislation that already exists. Uh, we need to acknowledge that there is a problem system-wide in public education. I don't need to remind you, or maybe I do, it maybe didn't get the press that the free press gave to charter schools, that the uh, superintendent of uh, Oakland ISD a few years back was uh, jailed for bribery and other corruption. So it's not, uh, it's not um, charter schools uh, alone that face these kinds of issues, but our public schools across the board. Finally, I would like to, for the record, observe that on your list of at-risk authorizers, over a third are traditional public school districts. Now, if they are going to be forbidden to authorize any more charter schools, will they be forbidden to authorize any more public schools? Are we applying the same standards to them? If they're not competent to charter a, to authorize a charter school, are they are they competent to? And that includes the largest school district in the state, I might add. So I think the issue, there are issues here, issues of accountability and transparency, but they apply across the board. And by persuading us to look only at one special uh, class of public school, it's, uh, it's going to cause our, uh, it's going to throw us off, um, throw our perspective off and um, cause us to be myopic. Thank you. I know you know this, by the way, but it's the previous Oakland school superintendent, not right, the current, right, not not the the current, current one. Right. He was More the candidate for the ago. superintendency last time he was around. In, Fortunately, two times around. Tom's time. It was Eileen and then John. 
So I don't have a complete list of what's in statute. I have some points that, that were sent to me last night, or else I would have forwarded those on, but I didn't find them until this morning as I was leaving. But to give you an idea of what's troubling to me, the first point under, and, and I want to add, I am totally in favor of transparency. And every time I've heard board members say during this conversation, I don't know who could be opposed to transparency. I don't know either. I don't know a single person in policymaking, in the government, and in charter schools who's opposed to transparency. That's not the issue. But under transparency, the first point that's here is in stature. That's my point. It is in statute. One more time, I can read it to you from here. I'm pretty sure of that one. The second point, outlaw the practice of an EMO serving as both the operator of a school with control over the school's budget and his landlord for the property in which the school leases, market conditions, that's a different issue. That is saying that you can't, that because they don't receive any, um, uh, any um, they don't receive the same amount of money per student and they don't receive any millage money, that somehow they have to abide by other people's impression of what market rate is for a building that has funding for buying and equipping and or leasing. And that, this statement is problematic because it can't be done within the way the charters are set up legally. Uh, require an open bid process, that's in statute. So if, if as we, it, it, it's, it's a mixture of apples, eggs, and kumquats. And what I would like to say is take it back, rework it so that the requests that you're making have, have uh, common sense to them and aren't in statute, and then we can probably have a conversation that's different from the one we're having right now. Um, you also, within this, I keep on hearing that you want to make sure that public funds can't be paid to a private vendor and lose their public transparency. That's not in this document. I can't find it any place. But I hear you saying that's what you want. That's the first point it's, right here. Yeah. That's right. It's the one you keep saying is already in statute. Yeah. Right here. The first point here. Yeah. Same information regarding transparency to traditional schools, regardless of whether they're managed by a for-profit company. This includes re information related to salaries, benefits, and contracts. Um, four uh, includes individual salaries as submitted to the Registry of Educational Personnel. Uh, just a second here. Curriculum okay. proof of insurance, copies of facility leases or deeds or both, and of any equipment leases. Copies of any management contracts or service contracts. Where do they go? Where are they? Where, where do they have to? Go? So if I Joe Public, the board of directors of the public school academy shall collect, maintain, and make available to the public and the authorizing body in accordance with applicable law and the contract at least all of the following information concerning the operation and management of the public school academy. Any management letters issued as part of the annual financial audit under, under subdivision. Any other information specifically required under the act. So I'm just asking you to stand back and reconcile this. It's totally different. If you go ahead, I defer to Cassandra. But Cassandra John. If you yeah. look under the transparency icon of a school, oftentimes when that school is run by a for-profit management company, those things are not reported on that icon because the for-profit company hires and fires all of the staff. Therefore, when it's set, when it, you look under the button for staff you get one sentence that says the school itself does not hire any staff end of story so to say that it's transparent is not really accurate because once it goes into the private company it's up to them to decide whether or not they're going to report that and oftentimes they don't that's what we're trying to get at here and but it's not clearly up. stated that that's what that in other words what what it, it, the supposition here is that there's nothing underneath this that, that I don't think anyone and then I want to go back to the broader issue here would argue that there are some issues to address around whether we know as much about how uh, for-profit companies are spending money as we do about public school districts themselves so making clarifying the transparency requirements so that we do know as much is certainly something that we all so we are treating them the same this is one of my points, which I want to come back to. In some ways, in order to treat them the same, we need changes in law to clarify, for example, issues of transparency. But there are also cases where they need to be treated differently. Uh, per, If we were going to open new schools and add new schools under the guise of choice and competition, we should have different expectations so we're not replicating poor performing schools and uh, definancing all of public education, which is what we're seeing. But let me go back to one of Richard's points. This is long before the free press. 
the original charter school legislation asked us, the state board and department, to produce annual reports on charter schools because people wanted to know a lot of things about how this new experiment was working. We, in those reports, made a series over the years of recommendations uh, consistent with what we're making now. We need greater uh, transparency. We need clarification of powers for who gets to police the system when there's unethical or illegal behavior. Who is it? Who's uh, in charge of pulling the trigger on various sanctions? Because it's been murky and it hasn't happened. We made those recommendations. Then several years ago, that annual report was rejected and eliminated. So we were the legislature took away the requirement for an annual report after ignoring those recommendations for years. And this was in the context of uh, changing or going backward on the legislation that basically had some attempt at quality control, saying quality charters replicate unlimited. You can have as many as you want, but bad charters that don't educate kids, we don't want to see those replicate or expand. That was taken out, step backward. And common sense pro-charter ed reform folks who had suggestions about how you could have some quality control as we're developing new schools and prevent what we have seen, the proliferation of good, mediocre, and very poor academically performing schools which uh, do damage to education for the students that choose them and do damage to education of the students left in traditional public schools. That is what we're seeing. We need to correct for that. That certainly requires legislation. So this is an ongoing, and, and when the reaction to these facts of what's happening, which is not a one-sided job in the free press, but just the facts of that history, that we've gone backwards versus forward on having a sensible, effective for outcomes charter choice policy, uh, when the reaction from the charter lobby, whatever that is, is no, nothing's wrong. We don't want to have big fixes. How do we negotiate with that? We have tried to negotiate. We need to insist on some attention to the direction of the fixes that we must make, which are true. And that's what we need to say today. I think it was Dan and Richard. Uh, you know what? I'm not quite ready. Can I get re He's working up, on a dissertation here. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Question four within D is still to come. So. Okay. Richard, please. Uh, well, I guess let me, let me respond to John's comment that uh, and simply say the fact is that in the 20 years uh, charter school movement has closed 90 schools. That is not nothing. Unless you think they have closed quality schools and kept the, kept the unquality schools going. So there is a level of accountability uh, and consequence to charters that, that is unthinkable for our, your traditional public schools. So, and, to, and to dismiss this as nothing is part of Iago's uh, half-truths there. I hope you noted in my comments before, I did not dismiss it. We need to be as serious about closing non-performing public schools wherever they are. And we have not been as serious as we should be. And now the I, other, and now if I may go on with the other point. Um, the kinds of accountability requirements for uh, private uh, vendors uh, that, from which schools purchase services uh, these are the same rules that apply to public school districts. In saying that you want private vendors who sell to charter schools uh, to open their books, are you saying, are you going to require the same uh, policy for uh, traditional districts which have contracts with private vendors for various services? That's cool. oh, yeah. Cassandra? Uh, I would just respond to that and say when we're talking about the, the contractors, we're not re referring to people who are emptying the trash or people who are shoveling the snow. We're talking about entities that take responsibility for the entire budget of a school and then dole it out as they see fit. There's a huge difference between that level of contractor versus someone who is doing work that was publicly bid for a public school and is now performing that work. I think we're talking about two completely different things. Are we, are we talking about 90% of the budget or 80% of the budget or 60% We're talking about all but $35,000 that, that is allowed to be spent by the board. Right, and FOIA applies to regular public schools. If I wanted to go find out, you know, how much, what the contracts were with a certain vendor, I, I can put a FOIA request in and I can get it. I can get access to that information at a public school. You can get the contracts that uh, you can get the contracts that charter schools have with their management How? companies as well. How? Before you. 
Well, what if they tell me they're a private entity and they're not subject to FOIA? Well, you may have to happen. take them to court, as has happened with some public well, school districts. Well, and that's what we're saying is wrong. That's it's just true. taxpayer that's dollars. Wrong. They're running an education establishment to educate yeah. children. Sure. We should know as much about how they spend their money. There is a qualitative difference for a food service contractor or a bus contractor as, yeah. as an, a whole school that's being run by a for-profit company. We were at a meeting the other day where someone was saying, who's, again, op operates charter schools? When you introduce, as we have, more than other states, two bottom lines to run an organization, making money and educate kids. There's a tendency, which we have seen revealed, for one of those bottom lines to prevail. And that's why we have to be, be overly diligent in exposing how money is spent so that we can prevent. I mean, sunshine is the best disinfectant. And you notice we are not calling for, and I am not calling for, no for-profit companies can run education establishments. We just have to be supremely vigilant, given what we are seeing, that sunshine is very brightly shown into the crevices of how that money is spent so that we don't see the kind of corruption, self-dealing, profiteering of taxpayer dollars that should be going to educate kids. Mm -hmm. We're getting back to hands being raised here because this is just okay. picking up a little temperature. So, Dan, I know you're still writing. I'm pausing for you. Uh, but yeah. I, no, it's okay. Yeah. Um, what page is it? Um, I call the vote here in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think I'm good. So let me jump in. <laughs> Um, uh, so, let me, so let me just be clear, I, we do tend to, I think, one of the interesting, so this is going to, this is a backup, um, one of the more interesting things that I've read or heard recently um, in the last year or two is that the simplest way to, to predict the um, kind of position of people on various issues is by their political affiliation, uh, which is to say that political affiliation has kind of become proxy for personal values in the United States. Um, uh, maybe that's <laughs> um, It is quite a statement. Uh, it is quite a statement. Um, it has tremendous implications if you think about it across like all walks of American life. Um, that's a conversation for another time and place. Uh, with alcohol. Right, with glasses <laughs> of wine. <laughs> um, so I am, uh, I do believe in the right of families to pick their school. Um, I think if we're not serious about desegregating housing patterns in this country, and I don't think we are. Um, I think that we have to allow folks to pick their school. Um, it's unethical to have poor folks live in one side of town and tell them that they all have to send their kids to a certain school. Um, as my grandfather used to say, we didn't actually desegregate uh, schools. Well, we, I'm sorry, we didn't integrate schools or communities in the United States. We desegregated them, right? So we, uh, we gave black folk the right to access white institutions, but we never... And white folk never really accessed black institutions. There was no integration in this country. We desegregated. Uh, and there's a fundamental difference between the two. Uh, and we're living with the consequences of the fundamental difference between the two. Um, I'm governance neutral here, right? So I say that to say I don't ultimately care whether it's a traditional school or a charter school. Um, I really don't. Uh, my agenda isn't set by the free press. Uh, I've been asking for and calling for the same stuff for a long time, long before the free press did their series of articles. Um, my agenda fundamentally is set by student performance, right? It's by outcomes for kids. Um, and I don't want to get emotional about it, but having uh, just have spent a um, a career just kind of living with and, and trying to remediate the impacts of um, our just lack of investment uh, in young people um, and dealing with the consequences of that. So um, I think ultimately our work has to be about students first and outcomes for students first. Um, let's be clear about a couple of other things that set the stage here. Uh, those students go to all schools. They go to charter schools, they go to traditional schools, right? they go to private schools, they go to 
EA schools, like they go to all of those schools. And so when we, when we do engage in the governance debate, um, frequently we're debating, we're debating kind of adult issues, um, and frequently I think we lose sight of the fact that, that there are kids at play in all of this. Not always, not always, um, but sometimes we do. Uh, in Detroit in particular, like 50, more than 50% of Detroit kids go to charter schools right now. Um, uh, they have become, uh, in, in many respects, the default uh, school system. Um, all right, three, there is a system-wide problem. I agree with my esteemed uh, colleague across the table. Um, we've got challenges in traditional schools and in charter schools and in EAA schools uh, and in private schools, in part because kids walk in the building with all sorts of challenges already, uh, given their walk of life uh, and the like, and in part because sometimes our adult-led institutions don't live up to their promise. Um, just the nature of the beast. Um, but doesn't excuse it, doesn't allow us to kind of <laughs> ignore it. Generally speaking, um, I want to treat all of these schools the same way. Um, I think there are precious few places. I may disagree with John, and generally he and I are, are fairly aligned on these, but I, I think there are precious few places where it makes sense to treat chartered schools and traditional schools differently. Um, and I say that really heavily informed by my experience in Detroit where charter schools are not alternatives. They're not, they're not the alternative. They frequently are the default. They frequently are the school closest to your home. They frequently are, I mean, there are more charter school buildings in Detroit than traditional buildings in Detroit. Um, uh, and and uh, for that reason, among others, I think that um, it, it doesn't make sense to set up loads of different laws to apply to, to apply to them. I get the argument around allowing for innovation, and I think there are ways to do that. Um, I suspect that we're well past that phase um, in this particular debate. So four, uh, and this is really important, there are good people working in all of these schools. Um, and it would be really easy for us to, um, for this conversation to sound like we're demonizing uh, people, all people in a certain sector, right? All people in charter schools. It's really easy for uh, statements made by charter school folks to be heard as, as uh, efforts to demonize all folks in traditional schools. Like, I don't, I don't think either is true. We've got great teachers working in all of those buildings. We have great school leaders working in all of those buildings. You have great board members and administrators working in all those buildings. And we've got some not so great folks working in all of those buildings. Um, that's the nature of the beast with these adult institutions. Um, and so I, I, and I'm going a little long here, but in part that's actually intentional to try and uh, take some of the heat out of this conversation uh, because I don't want folks to feel personally attacked. In the end, this isn't about individuals. Um, I think it's also worth noting that ideology is in play here as much as, as we'd like it, as much as I might like it not to be. Um, it's in play in both directions. Um, I suspect that there are some here, and certainly there are some in this state, who would eliminate traditional schools altogether. Uh, and I suspect there are some here, and certainly there are some in this state, who would eliminate charter schools altogether. And all too often, our efforts to correct flaws in our policies and laws are um, either kind of hijacked by those agendas or, um, or are uh, are attacked because um, attacked by the suggestion that those agendas are hidden within them, and they aren't always. So, given all of that, um, there's some changes that I want to suggest to this uh, statement. And my apologies for not doing this work ahead of time. I was out of town on vacation, um, happily. Uh, so, number one. Uh, and I do have a bunch of smaller changes that maybe I won't give, go through the details on it this, right now, just because other folks I know want to talk. Number one is I would move educational quality expectations to the front. Um, I think the order of these three items um, is flawed. I think the most important thing here is educational quality expectations. Uh, and frankly, if we had better outcomes for all kids, like a lot of this other stuff, we probably wouldn't care as much about. 
Um, maybe we would. Maybe some of us would, right? But, like, if, if we had great outcomes for kids, we might not care as much about how much the lease cost. We might. Some of us might, but some of us might not. Let's move that first. It is, it is the reason that we are in this, around this table in the first place, is for educational quality outcomes. Let's put that first. I would delete most of that paragraph, um, which I think um, tends to inflame, uh, and replace it all with a single sentence, um, uh, which is that the State Board of Education calls on the legislature to adopt quality control provisions and pass legislation that could include provisions such as. Um, which makes it consistent with the, the lead-ins for the other two, by the way, which don't call, don't describe kind of what's wrong with the system, just call, describe like what we want, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, second big thing, um, I would add a call here to enforce existing laws. Um, I don't know, I haven't read the statute uh, like uh, Dr. Z and Eileen. Um, I'm taking them at their word as honorable people at this table that some of the stuff that we're calling for does exist. I don't know, like, I, I, I'm not sure that, so I'm guessing that law asks for, or requires that charter schools list that information. Um, and that's different, of course, than that their management company lists that information. Um, so small, small distinction, um, but a meaningful one, perhaps. Nonetheless, um, uh, I, think, I think your point that you're making is, is well made um, and well taken here, which is that to the extent that some of this stuff already exists in state law, then let's call for it, its appropriate enforcement. Um, that's a perfectly reasonable request, and I think um, uh, appropriate for us to include in this statement. Third, um, I would love to call in this statement for um, equal application of laws. Um, I don't know if it's appropriate to do that at the front or the back, but like I, I've been struck by the, by the fact that there are charter school advocates who point out that traditional schools, and I'm holding up the document that Dan Quisenberry provided earlier, that traditional schools aren't required to do all this, right? And at the same time, I hear traditional school advocates say, yeah, but charter schools aren't required to do, and I'm flipping Dan's document over, aren't required to do all this, right? And I'm hearing everybody say, then let's be fair about it, right? With the exception of those who are saying, let's free up a, some folks for innovation, and great, then let's create some kind of an innovation district or the right of people to, let's do something entirely different. Like, if actually what we want is a fair playing field here, then let's call in this statement for equal application of the laws um, uh, to both traditional and charter schools. Um, and to the point that Dr. Z and John made earlier, um, I would, as an advocate for children, um, and as a, as a resident of Detroit, I would suspend the ability of any, any entity to open a new school if their existing schools are poor performance. I don't care if it's a traditional district, nor do I care if it's charter. Um, ultimately, the reason for us funding this work is for the well-being of kids. And the particular governance model of the school district should not exempt you from the right, or from the responsibility, rather, of producing great outcomes for kids. Um, I think that's it for now. Richard, you had your hand up, sir. Yes. Um, I wanted to thank my esteemed colleague for uh, restoring us to perspective. I, I deeply appreciate that. And just to back that up, I wanted to say that um, uh, I, I certainly agree that uh, many of our policies can be reevaluated, fine tuned, adjusted, uh, make them more appropriate. Um, I think each one has to be decided on its merits, and uh, we certainly have much to. Uh, and, and I think you set a good example just now in terms of specifics uh, that we can negotiate on. So thank you very much. Thank you. We're ready for kind of a restatement and then a vote. Yeah, and, and I really I appreciate everybody's um, contributions, and this is not easy, and I appreciate Dan's um, thoughtful things and fundamentally agree with him. And so as, as much as I, once we get into wordsmithing something, it can be a tar baby effect, but I, I, I think if the makers of the motion are comfortable with um, embracing Dan's changes, I would, 
I would encourage us to incorporate those and call the question. Yeah. So, so what is our PC? Uh, uh, yes, ma'am. Only one thing that I'm from the west side of the state. I'm from Grand Rapids, Michigan. All of the discussion is about Detroit. Even Dan says, as a citizen of Detroit, this is not about Detroit. This is about the schools in the state of Michigan. So if we're going to propose anything at this table, it has to have everybody in this state in mind. Yes, I agree. Yes. Just to be clear, like I was offering personal perspective, you know, I live in Detroit, I don't happen to live in Grand Rapids. I uh, do completely agree that this is a statewide board and, and our policies should have statewide implication and, and uh, thought and reason behind them. So didn't mean to suggest otherwise, don't mean to exclude folks on the west side of the state, just offering my personal experience, which happens to be from southeast Michigan. So I think we have to include the UP. I want to make sure everyone's clear on this. We're not going to just... No, that's a serious thought because a lot of people, it's one thing about the distribution. I, I actually, on a serious note, hear that about no representation from the UP or Northern Michigan. So are you taking it into account? I said they do. Yes, uh, ma'am. I'm sorry, me? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Um, I, I, I appreciate very much, Dan, the spirit of your comments. And um, overall, were the statements to simply be that um, global, I would uh, glow along with it. In fact, our statement is very similar to that. But it's the specifics still in the uh, concerns and the fact that they're not meshed with statute that will probably have me voting no against it because I don't think we can revise it quickly enough today to make that work. So. Okay. Hey, Kathleen, did you have your hand up? Well, I, I appreciate Dan's comments as well. Uh, I, I, I think if you're, if, you're, if you're talking about moving the education quality expectations up to number one, I think that's a good idea. Mm -hmm. But you're, you're uh, saying we should eliminate that paragraph. So the, the language up until the last sentence, which is fine. If it's uh, inflammatory and not needed, which is probably um, could be interpreted that way, I think that's fine. I mean, we're basically calling for quality control, mm -hmm. uh, some, mm -hmm. some strategy yeah. for that, and for all but schools you're, you're who keep, want to. But you're keeping the, the uh, reinstating the, the smart cap. Yeah, as examples uh, of how it could be done. You're keeping the bullet points. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. And then the Any other major change was uh, there were two others. Enforce existing laws Enforce. if these items are already addressed. Which I think could be added to the second paragraph where we talk, it's, uh, we talk about two other things, the state soup um, Exercising authorities under existing law and the state board calling, and, and then uh, there's this calling on um, legislation. I think we could also call on the department and others to better enforce existing laws, um, you know, where clarity already exists. Uh, and then the last thing is, I, I would love a statement. I get that this is hard for folks, um, but I really would love a statement. And I'll be honest, I. I um, I, I won't oppose this, but I might end up abstaining from it um, without this. I, I just think it's time for us to um, to uh, adopt a statement that calls on um, equal application of all laws to traditional and charter schools. Um, I just I think the notion that that kind of they're they're separate entities is a fiction at this point. Um, that they're just wildly different entities is a fiction at this point. So uh, I know what folks might, might disagree. Um, can I just say, I, I don't uh, oppose the, the spirit of what you're saying, but you do have radically different governance models. So yeah. closing one that's governed by a, a, an appointed board versus closing one that ha is an elected board with publicly held property and publicly two radically different things. So yeah. I'm just saying I think it's easier said than done, but I'm not opposed to the and suggestion. The, the, the challenge would be if if it could be interpreted and would be by everyone in the spirit in which you were offering Everybody it, which I that. totally agree right. with. But I could see I could see that statement also being either willfully misinterpreted, oh that means equal funding for all pupils. That means charters and traditional public schools must have the same access to capital and infrastructure fundraising tools, uh, mm -hmm. something I support, by the way, which doesn't exist now, to equalize the, the playing field. So uh, I just am, I'm, 
if, if we can't guarantee anything, I would support the statement. But it, just I am noting that it could be a, it could be a window in which many could in, choose to interpret it in profoundly different ways. It, it, yeah, yeah my, as I said, ideologies <laughs> in play. I'm sorry, I'm not raising. No, my no, no, please. Dan ideologies Michel. in play here. Like I suspect that many things uh, in the <laughs> statement will be willfully misinterpreted. Um, well, that shouldn't, that shouldn't stop us from saying the right thing, um, given what we believe. Um, we all believe what we believe is the right thing. Right, right. I mean, where we can agree, you know, have enough votes to agree on what is the right thing, I think we should say it even knowing that folks will, will fully, I mean, that's the nature of politics, right? I mean, so welcome to the State Board of Education. <laughs> Michelle, and then I'd appreciate yeah, it if, if you right. take a moment to hear my comments after the vote. I don't want to influence mm -hmm. the vote, so I won't wait. I, I'll, but if you don't mind, I would like to do that. Okay. Um, I just wanted to go on record as saying that, you know, to me this is, like just some very basic minimal changes that I think will hopefully shed light that we can have information to to correct problems, root out you know sort of corruption or improve performance. Because without it, you want to base you know. And, and I have to say, I, saying that somehow I care about kids and other people are motivated by ideology is kind of rubbing me the wrong way because I think we all care about kids. I think we all have our own perspectives and opinions. Um, and and I think um, to somehow dismiss um, somebody takes a position, like I personally don't think there should be for-profit charter schools. I think it is just too wrought with all kinds of problems that are too difficult to control. Um, and I don't, I personally don't think somebody should be able to make money off of kids to buy a yacht. They should take that money and put it back into the schools. So, you know, so this is, this to me, I'm putting my, my other perspectives aside. But I think this is just common sense. It seems to be something that I am having a hard time understanding why people would oppose it because it just seems just like good business, good governance, regardless of what you're doing. I also want to point out that I don't think charter schools have done anything to help integration or desegregation. Um, if anything, they may have perpetuated further segregation. And um, so, I, uh, um, so I look at how we're structuring them and how they're isolated from districts where in other states they're under one district, like in Massachusetts, or where the board has oversight over all the, has a lot more control over this oversight and placement, so it makes sense. I also, this talk about we should just let them close. I live in, De well, I'm sorry, I live in Detroit. <laughs> and we've had 100 schools close, and it demolishes communities. That's not what I mean when I say But close. I know. But, but, but in a lot of those public schools, the, the charters that close, it's for financial. Not because they were closed, because they were not being academically sound. They're financial reasons. And the same reason why they close schools in Detroit. So it's not like a, so I, I hear a lot of um, discussion. Um, and. To, but for me to say, just let them open and close, however and wherever, it, it's, it's uh, and I, you know, I'm driving around this, and I see, oh, look at that warehouse, it's turning into a charter school, oh, look at that thing over there, that, where they make fireworks, they're going to be like, half that building's going to be for charter school, it's, 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 there needs to be some type of, you know, rational, you know, you say it's not about the adults, but the adults have to act in a rational way to ensure financial responsibility and that the kids are being, um, you know, are, are really uh, have them in mind. So can I, I just had to get that out of my system. <laughs> okay. I'm going to get out of my system. Listening. That can, can, we, can I suggest, and, I, and I'm a co-owner of this, so a better investment in agenda planning of topics we would like to further explore and think through. I mean, a couple have been put on the table that are certainly connected to this but aren't the question you're actually calling and maybe we want to have further discussions along those lines. I think there's, in a way, it's good to get at the root of what some of these issues are with individual board members and it might infer other policy decisions. But are we okay to call a vote mm -hmm. at this point on this particular issue and mm, we're not? I want, the, I, wanted, I want you to tell me what's going to be on the vote. I want to hear the okay. motion how I'm going to vote. Okay, so. Go ahead. Oops, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. I just want to get queued in before we vote. Please. Do you want me to answer a question first? Please. 
Okay. Uh, so the motion then, I believe both of the myself and the seconder have agreed to the request from Dan. So it would be to support um, the, the language with the changes of moving um, the quality expectations up to number one ahead of transparency and accountability, removing the paragraph following quality uh, educational quality expectations and replacing it except for some introductory sentence for right. the paragraph. Right, Re replacing it with a sentence that based, says something along the lines of the State Board of Education calls to adopt quality control provisions that, and then keep the four bullet points that are there. Um, add a line about enforcing, in this, the second paragraph, add a line about better enforcement of existing laws when clarity already exists, and then adding a statement about equal application of the law. Did I capture everything? Are you, is that sa at least satisfactory for you to decide on whether to vote? Do you have to say whatever you need to say? Mm -hmm. Well, it, it, it just, the, the conversation got dragged in so many different directions, you know, now I don't know whether I want to vote or not. Why don't we? Because it we can meddled a lot what we had agreed to. It, the I, only thing that has really changed is that major paragraph. All of the bullet points remain the same. So all of the recommendations that we are giving them, the legislature, have not changed. I could call the question, and and folks could abstain, vote yes, vote no, and we could go from there, if you'd like. Is that okay? Call a question. Can oh, I just get yeah, right again? Yes. Um, just four quick things. Uh, agree, Michelle, that charters have not improved <coughs> integration and didn't mean to suggest that they have. I don't know that I would agree that they've made it worse, but um, didn't mean to suggest that charters were a solution to that, just that school choice, however implemented and with appropriate public funding for infrastructure, could help remediate. Um, the existing segregation in our societies. We can talk more about that later. Two is, um, when I say close schools, I don't mean shutter the building. Um, in many other states, the way that they, uh, when I say close schools, what I mean is um, completely transform uh, the school environment, and in many other states they do that uh, at by grade level, so they will phase out a high school as they're phasing in a new high school in the same building. Um, the building is a public asset, it's typically been publicly financed, at least the nature of buildings in most of our communities, it should remain a publicly financed, like a public asset, um, as opposed to the uh, liability that it um, frequently becomes when it's closed uh, and kind of rots our communities from the inside out. Third, um, my, it's a great point that you're making, Mr. Superintendent, and I just want to acknowledge my failure to kind of be more active on agenda planning calls, um, and my commitment is that I will try and be much more active and committed to helping us build a productive agenda on those calls. I think your suggestion is great, and I hear you. I just want you to know I hear you. And fourth, and most importantly, is I want to apologize to Michelle. I um, certainly did not mean to impugn your credibility or anyone's, as I said in the statement. I think there are good people working in all of these buildings. I think there are good people on all sides of this debate. There's plenty of room for disagreement. There is. Um, uh, I don't mean to suggest that your beliefs are wrong. Um, I simply was sharing my personal beliefs the same way that I want you to be able to share your personal beliefs. Uh, and so to the extent that that landed on you as an attack, a personal attack, I, I do apologize. Not my intention for you or anyone else here. John and then Craig. Craig, Craig and then John. Well, I don't have a vote, but I'm with Lupe. I mean, you need to see in print revisions to a motion, or you're heading down a very slippery slope of ambiguity. All right, let's do it. For example, like equal applications. We can, we can insert exactly where those sentences go. Um, but what is the sentence? What is the sentence, John? So how about I suggest specifically the changes? So the folks have them? Mm -hmm. uh, and then we can well, wordsmith it, those. It, it, I'm not looking to unnecessarily delay or derail things. But why wouldn't you work as a committee 
to iron these changes out and then come back at the next meeting. We do this every meeting. Mm -hmm. This is not and we have worked with the committee, and unfortunately, Dan wasn't able to get his suggestions ahead of time. And there are other changes and nuances of what we might include in here that uh, I and others could offer. But uh, this is in the right direction and the right both spirit and content of the 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 things that the legislature needs to go to work on. And it is August and the legislature's coming back and they're going to start throwing ideas uh, against the wall. And we're trying to provide our best guidance on what is the direction and what are the topics and what is the nature of the kind of changes. Not specific specificity, but the nature of the changes that we think need to be made. And we're, uh, by way of encouragement to Lupe, I think we, with Dan's comments, do not alter the direction and the spirit that uh, the committee and others of us put together and collaborate on this draft. We can put in exactly where the language goes. But let me just offer, uh, I was going to offer by way of example, I learned there are other nuances and things that are important that could be included down the road in, in charter school legislation. For example, I learned uh, in some communities, probably Grand Rapids and Detroit among them, Oftentimes, a charter school is the only school left in certain neighborhoods. And one of the unintended consequences of our shining the spotlight on the authorizer's performance is to their credit, they shut down their bad performers, leaving no neighborhood school. Um, so are there expectations for um, public input? And that's true about the existing neighborhood schools that you were saying, we closed them down. Are there better expectations about public process, public input, when schools are open, closed, charter, non, that need to be part of the discussion? That probably is true, but I'm not throwing them into this document. I'm just, I'm sure there's lots of things we could throw in this document. But let's get it finished. And I would encourage my colleagues to vote for it. And I'm delighted that we can have a robust majority uh, supporting these recommendations before the legislature begins to go to work. Yes, ma'am. I was just saying I support that as well. And I think um, that this is just basic direction to the legislature. I think it's. Um, uh, I, I think it's, uh, in, in light of the, what's been uncovered, it's, it's a responsible thing to do to pass it now, or to vote on it now. Um, Dan's working on one sentence, but once we have that, I can read you exactly what the changes okay. will reflect. Okay. okay. All right, ready? <laughs> All right. So, the first paragraph does not change. The second paragraph would change to say, in addition to enhanced scrutiny and accountability for charters being developed by the State Superintendent of Public Instruction under existing law, the State Board of Education calls on the legislature to develop comprehensive charter school reform legislation that mends with clarity the major flaws in the current charter law or better enforces existing laws where clarity already exists having to do with transparency, accountability, and educational, I'm sorry, educational quality, transparency, and accountability. The next uh, be uh, in front of transparency, we'd move up educational quality expectations. That paragraph would be removed and would be replaced with the State Board of Education calls on the legislature to adopt quality control provisions such as, and then the four bullets would remain as they are. That would follow up with transparency, which is not changing followed by accountability, which also is not changing, and then would end with, do you want to read your sentence? Sure, something like, uh, finally, the State Board of Education calls upon the legislature to ensure that education laws apply equally in all areas to both traditional and charter schools. Currently, some apply to charters and not traditional, semicolon, others the reverse. What was the last part? Um, Currently, some apply to charter, some use slangs. Why don't we just say period? Yeah, just well, We could say it. period. That'd be great. Yeah. I, but I don't want this to be read as one way. Let me, let me be clear. Actually, I think the second sentence is really important. If we leave it as is, and the rest of the document speaking only about charter schools, what folks will read it as is um, a, we sh that we're asking that charters have to submit to all the same rules as traditional schools, and that it only go that way. Mm -hmm. I'm asking for both. That traditional schools have to live up to, like, I mean, whatever, some of the stuff in, in the statement that, that Dan Quisenberry brought. Like, great. Then let's, let's have traditional schools live with this, too. I want it to go both ways. And so I want us to be explicit here. I think a sentence, second sentence is important. It says, currently, some laws apply to charter schools and not traditional, semicolon, others the reverse. Like, I want, like, so let's, 
that's sign sunshine in all of those places with all schools. So there would be procedurally there's a vote now on the amendments. Mm -hmm. And shall we are we ready to do that? Mm -hmm. Appreciate the clarity now. Um, Vote. This is on the amendments, not on the overall resolution. All in favor, we aye. Vote, we vote on an amended resolution. Yes, I amended the, the motion to reflect these changes. Okay. And, I, and uh, Kathleen agreed. Well, uh, so it is on the overall. What did you say, Kathy? We're voting I'm on sure it. I'm sure about the last sentence. I don't. But Currently, I some laws apply to charter schools and not traditional, semicolon. Other laws apply to, let's spell it all out, other laws apply to traditional schools and not charter schools. That would encourage us to approve the yeah. amended resolution. So we're going to have one vote. It's going to be on the amended resolution. <laughs> What's that? Oh, nothing. nothing. <laughs> <laughs> thought you had six votes. I, I, I would not get caught up in that language there because I don't think that's all law. Just saying it's We're just talking about the law. I don't know if yeah. this is, listen, I don't know if this is right or not, but let's just take one, two, three, four, the fifth bullet. Agree that no school district should hire anyone with specifically identified family relationships with any member of that district school board. Right? And you're really saying if that I mean, became law, not, well, it would have to go both ways. Yeah, it isn't law like, right so now. So if that's a Dan, conflict of interest, Dan's if we point, think that's a problematic conflict of interest, it's Dan, a problematic conflict of interest in any school. Dan's point is that they're doing that you know, you know, laterally because they believe, or maybe that was in the amended, that was in the amended in law. The, yeah. Thank you. That's right. That was in the amended <laughs> law. Right. So let's apply the Although I would give credit for that was something that the charter folks thought was appropriate. For like a board member, it should, should apply the EMO, but that's a whole other story. Yeah. And we already Probably. discussed the, the, the spirit of what we're saying, and it's subject to interpretation, and it is not legislation. And I, yeah. I think we have a very good package of recommendations we're making to the legislature. I would remind us that is our constitutional job, is to make recommendations to the legislature and the governor on the requirements for public education yeah, right. and the financial requirements I, I thereof. Agree. I agree. I want to make recommendations. Okay. So, Okay. So, I would, what we're doing is we're voting on the amended resolution. Yes. All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, same? No. No. So, I, do we need a roll call? Or you got the no. <laughs> Six two vote. Uh, it was yeah. Eileen and yeah. Richard. Could I ask for a roll call vote? Let's do that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Austin? Yes. Recto? Yes. Ramos Montini? Yes. Strauss? Yes. Uh, Albrich? Yes. Barner? Yes. Weiser? No. Siley? No. Did I call eight names? I did. In addition, we do have a statement that we'll be submitting uh, for uh, disbursement on the list, sir. Richard and I do. Okay. Thank you. So I don't know if that's not if it's I'd be not happy to. I only have one copy policy. Of it. That is against our policies. Okay, then we'll distribute another way. We 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 agreed together that we submit. Uh, we ask our MDE staff to only uh, formally uh, communicate formal board policy positions, or to help individuals with clearly stated individual yeah. policies. You're free to send right. out an individual statement, but it yeah. should not be labeled a minority report or anything that was endorsed by the, the board. Happy to do that. We're also happy to give you copies of it. It wasn't printed up until just before we sat down for lunch, after lunch. So. Now, yeah, can, I, can I ask, I set the tone and then Craig left, so <laughs> maybe I'll make a separate call to him, but I, I do appreciate if you give me one moment on connecting the dots. I'm an educator and we try to look for teachable moments, so if I can have, class, if I can have your eyes here. Educate us. This, <laughs> no, not that, no, I don't mean that, you know, that sounds patronizing and I don't mean it, but the reason I was telling Craig would still be here and I'll make a separate call to him is what we did, what I did yesterday, first of all, was at risk, um, and the reason I didn't take a deep breath on that 
is with the possible exception of the academic part, which we're going to meet with the authorizers again on, everything else is what we think is in the law that needs to be enforced by the authorizers. And I tried to use a very simplistic example this morning, which is if a charter school that you authorize hasn't posted its budget, you better make sure they post their budget. So there are, to the credit of the charter folks who kind of gently but directly gave me some constructive criticism in the stakeholder meeting, I need to acknowledge the changes that have already been made in the law recently, two years ago. But we also, I have a responsibility to state soup to make sure, kind of like you inferred in this one paragraph, that, that they're enforcing that. It doesn't mean we're making judgments about it. It may not even mean that the authorizer is making judgments about it. But they need to enforce those things that have been called for. So whether it's transparency or whether it's posting budgets and all that. The possible exception that there is some, there is some possible disagreement about is, is the spirit of the academic thing. I feel as state soup, I need to look into that in a way that I think not only did, I think three people today, I think Dan, Mr. Love, Dan Quisenberry, this Dan, talked about outcomes being an important thing. So I, I think it's appropriate to at least get on the table the idea that what does a portfolio look like? And in my view, we're gonna come up with a metric in agreement that will show is that portfolio moving in the right direction, even if it's in the low, bottom 10%, and that's an outcome that we would value. If it's, if it's a portfolio that just continues to sink, that's something we need, I think we need to. If for some reason we lost a challenge on that, which has been inferred, I would still proceed with it. There'd just be no consequence for it, apparently, other than our view and my view as state superintendent that that portfolio is going in the wrong direction. Uh, so I'd be satisfied with that if that's what it came down to. I think it's in the interest, and I do believe a call I got from our president last night tells me that he also believes it's in his interest to try to understand is the portfolio going in the right direction or not as a whole and is happy to be part of that. But they'll, you know, in fairness, that'll be ironed out in the next, partly in the stakeholder meeting that we're going to have. Um, but I would concede that Rather, I'd rather clarify that all the other elements that we're looking at are already in there, and they just need to be making sure that they're actually being adhered to. That's their responsibility as an authorizer. Mm -hmm. um, that's why I think they're appropriately paid in order to try to do oversight and other reasons. Thank you. So, and it ties into some of your comments is the reason I wanted to. Now, we're going to run right to the superintendent. Yep. So, superintendent, sir. Um, quickly, oh. a... Um, we discussed agenda planning. Let's, let's, with the help of our department, renew the call for public input through the various mechanisms, as Mike did publicly today, with the deadline of the end of the month, the last day of the month, so that we are um, re-inviting and making sure we're providing every opportunity for people to, as they did today in public and, and through the electronic means, report in um, their recommendation. Um, Dan had written up some notes from the retreat, um, which I didn't want to circulate as a public document here today just because it could be misinterpreted as this is what they're looking for. Um, and and we, we need to get additional input from other stakeholders and look at those two things together. So I think over the next couple weeks, we should both invite more input, um, circulate, uh, share in some organized way some of that input that we're getting along with uh, the summaries of the discussion that we did have about our own expectations. And I, we might need a meeting um, in early September, a special meeting to work together on that description of the uh, job, our qualifications criteria, based on both our thinking and public input. So I, I think we should do that. Um, while we, uh, Craig Ruff and the administration, I think, does have a, um, uh, a ability and a plan for gathering resources to dedicate towards the superintendent uh, search consultancy help organization. So however we proceed on that needs to be informed by uh, their recommendation on where that money is coming from and how it needs to be uh, decided. Does it have to be bid or, or whatever? So we don't know the answer to that question yet. Um, but so that's what I would recommend. And are people willing to try to schedule a, a meeting phone yes. call in early mm -hmm. September, probably in, mm -hmm. before our next meeting? Uh, and so, and alongside us working through these other issues. Before the next meeting Tonight. in September? Probably. 
Or is yeah. it long said, yeah, because we need yeah. we need to spend a little bit of time. It can be by phone, but we need to have some just focused discussion on shaping our criteria and and uh, having that beginning, and then engage some um, uh, search firm assistance in beginning to uh, go out there while we uh, have a deadline for public input and stakeholder input, uh, and with some help, kind of look at what people are saying to us in some organized way. Good. So you'll work with Mertz on finding time for you, and that'll be the board at that point. So um, if there's anything we can do to support something, let us know. Yes, just one point on that. I, I think it's important at our next meeting that we, if we are going to hire an executive search firm, that we have a motion uh, available to us at that meeting to hire said firm. Uh, so I don't know what, I'm not sure, based on the last set of uh, communications, kind of what has to happen in terms of, um, uh, RFPing and well, that's know, what Craig and, and the governor's yeah. office okay. need to yeah. help advise us on how mechanically uh, we can make that turn that on. I think we someone maybe if the department can also reach out to a firm just to get a sense of what the threshold would be, so we know if we'd be over or under that. We could do that, that if you threshold. don't mind. Um, if you have some firms in mind. Okay. And would suggest them we could do the homework on that. Look, some firms. Right yeah, there, there were uh, three or four that. Um, yeah, I have them in a document. I think I can access the. You could, so you, you. Part of it, to your point, I think my experience with some of this is you. It'll be important who you select, um, and you'd want to have some confidence that they've met other boards' needs. It doesn't necessarily have to be state board. That would be ideal, but they've met their needs. Because I can remember, and I don't think, I think these can be weeded out pretty quickly, but it used to be less so now, I would say, but certainly 20 years ago, certain firms had their own stable, they called it. So you were pretty much Introduced to their talent, huh? candidates that were their talent, <laughs> and I, you know, and there's some value, by the way, to say who do you out of your relationships think would be appropriate. That's fine as long as you have an option in another vehicle to get candidates that may not meet that. You uh, you can add in the RFP a reference and references section that requires yeah. them to give you others that they've done similar work for. Right. So you'll be able to see that. But we'll get a general sense, of, if I'm understanding your point, of range of prices on what, you know. They're probably going to say for this kind of search, it's this amount. For a less strenuous search, it's this amount. If you do this part, and we'll try to find out what that is. Because for audience members, there's a threshold in terms of uh, money that might be available for the board in the, in the general fund budget as of October 1, and then there's thresholds for where that would have, what process that would go through, depending on whether it was X dollars or Y dollars. If I okay. ask a question yes, really quickly, um, uh, I had uh, inquired as to whether there was any difference in liability for the search parameters and the execution if we went through DTMB or through the department, and I just didn't catch the answer to that if that was brought up just now. Is that part of the correct thing? Yeah, we can get that from Craig. I mean, in general, I think where we maybe didn't word this as well as we could have, they, they would accept the responsibility for going through all the protocols that you may want to make sure are done in, a, in, a, um, in an RFP that you would want. We could even, without that, get DTMB assistance or our own. Well, uh, SBE, as in Maryland, isn't used to doing that. MDE is, and uh, the, uh, the DT, <laughs> Department of Management Budget, Technology Management Budget is used to doing it. So I, I didn't care. I just wanted to make sure that um, because there's a separate entity with the state board involved with the department, that it was easy to do and made any, sense. Any thoughts about that, Kai, or anyone else? Uh, no, I, I don't know. We can check into it. I mean, I think you're concerned about liability if you want to. I mean, they, like my preference, they'll be able to articulate and follow the processes that they do with their other contracting pieces that, and I think we could do on our own as well, um, without them having to run it per se. We follow the same protocols even when we're below the threshold, so I think we could accommodate that for you. Because, again, this isn't for the selection of the superintendent. This is for the selection of the firm. firm yeah. And some of that's going to come down to, I don't think there is an obligation. Well, I don't know that, actually. We should check out. I don't think it's an obligation to go with uh, 
low bid. It's, it's a matter of looking at did they meet your needs. But that might be the liability piece. We'll do some more homework on it. Um, consent agenda. May I have a motion, please? So moved. Supported Sorry. by John. Supported by Eileen. All in favor, aye. Aye. Opposed, same. Um, dare I say any board member comments? <laughs> <laughs> no, I would. I would yes, bring up that. Sorry. Well, she started. You, you can. Uh, yes, ma'am. And then I. I would just bring up that John and I, uh, along with uh, Representative Rogers and Representative Representative Zemke, ooh, Zemke, that's a lot to say. I uh, uh, attended the the Ann Arbor Public Schools board meeting in which they voted to uh, con uh, not consolidate annex, consoli annex uh, Whitmore Lake, mm -hmm. and uh, it was. I know that since then uh, they have submitted an application for a significant significant amount of funding from the department. Um, and the discussion at the board meeting was really interesting because uh, we don't know whether state law really allows the easy facilitation of something like this. And I think that having um, uh, Mr. Zemke and Mr. Rogers there was useful because there may be a discussion as we move forward on how you take two districts who are viable now, not in crisis, and find a way that's appealing to their voters to allow them to merge so that their, their financial stability will be ensured for quite a while to come and academics for children will really change uh, is an important thing for the state to be doing. Yeah. By the way, thank you for, and I, I know you understood yeah. I was doing the authorizer the meeting that day. Right now, but they will be. We shared the Didn't contents quite. of your letter and uh, the, the, we all spoke in broad euphemisms that we were applauding the, uh, the energy and uh, Creativity and uh, interest in exploring this this potential because it's pretty it could be a pretty powerful solution for long term stability. But they have to find their way there, right? And that we were all interested in helping them with whatever they chose to do. We immediately the next day got their request, sent our approval in for to start this. So that's behind us. That part. Oh, yes, this, just, this is um, a personal remark. No, no, I'm next. Oh, yes, you <laughs> sorry. are. Oh, I apologize for that. Sorry. Sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yes, no. Okay, well, what I want to say is uh, that I truly appreciate working with all the board members. Uh, we all come from Detroit. I know. Suburbs of Detroit. <laughs> no, we all bring in different perspectives to the table. And <laughs> I truly appreciate all of you, and of course, our new Teacher of the Year, Melo, Melody. Melody. <laughs> Melody. And I also want to personally thank all the staff uh, for the fantastic job that they do uh, at our board meetings, for their patience and all the questions that we ask, all the comments that we made. I appreciate the superintendent uh, being as calm. I wish I was as <laughs> calm as you are. Uh, and I know that uh, in your position, I know I read some of those comments. Don't read them. Yeah. Yeah. As Mayor Hardwell says, Lupe, I don't read those because, yeah. uh, um, you know, they're angry people. And everybody's entitled to their perceptions. Yeah. So yeah, I just, whatever. when I retire, I'm going to try to force them to have the courage to do it to my face as opposed to constantly No, no, you don't want to know that. Then you get to have it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. true. No, 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 no. <laughs> but anyway, uh, all in all, uh, I, I want to say thank you to everybody in the room. I, and, and I really appreciate all of you. The new, I know we have new staff members too, so it's a great meeting. Thank you. Appreciate your comments Thank in you. general, but also about the staff. It is, we debrief, we'll be here quite a while tonight. And uh, and by the way, if I'm looking calm, this has taken a long time. If, if you know the thing about the duck where they look like they're just going along and underneath, <laughs> my feet are actually moving like a duck all the time, furiously. Um, if I could, yes, just one last remark. This is um, a personal request. Um, uh, uh, my brother-in-law is um he's in a different he's um in a different state he's the principal of concord high school and i would like to send a letter on his behalf um from our group um he wasn't expecting sorry he was voted as principal of the year for 2014, he was also the middle school principal of the year about 10 years ago, 
He's just diagnosed with ALS. And there's, um, there's just like a lot of community support coming for him. And I would just like to send something from our board, just um, some words of encouragement and recognizing him sort of as a personal favor for me. So if sure. that's okay, yeah, I, think you know, do that. I would like to do this. Oh, yes. Thank you. We'll make yep. that happen and we'll, we'll uh, seek your approval on some wording that we'll come up with and see okay. what that needs. Thank yeah. you. Very sad. Sorry to hear that. Yeah. Okay. I'd well. like to echo what Lupe said about thanking everybody. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. That's very nice. I think it. I just don't say it. So <laughs> thank you for saying. It. Right, can I good. confess? Um, she's the, from the, the, the dissection, the anti dissection lobby. Oh gosh! So happy. What is that? Oh, <laughs> What's in it? There's not a frog positive. in there, is there? Mar Marilyn put it in a brown paper envelope because yeah. they didn't send like chocolates for everybody, oh, okay. and so I just stuck it in my thing. But does anybody want a chocolate from the? Is it, is it a chocolate frog? frog? <laughs> I haven't looked at the good yeah. crunchy <laughs> frog. Chocolate frog legs. Chocolate. chocolate frog they legs. are. They obviously appreciate our um, maybe uh, all our public oh, policy. Uh, the one just Kerwin chocolates. Our public policy innovations. Oh, no, they're real ah, chocolates. They're real chocolates, and there are nine of them. Sweet. Well, they're real chocolate on the outside. <laughs> All right, so. All right, yeah. Leave them there. Um, All right. <laughs> yeah, I told you could get points. So we're. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>